All right. My name is Ben Burgess. This is Give Them an Argument. I am joined once again by the People's Econ Prof, um, Rob Larson. Rob, how are you doing today? I'm great, man. It's always great to be back. Yeah. So I uh, figured when I saw that this had happened, and it's actually pretty recent, like I feel like this is within the last few months. Um, this seemed like a perfect one uh, to cover. This is going to be, um, this is going to be past GTA guest uh, Matt Brunig uh, yes. de debating past GTA guest uh, Yaron Brook. In fact, uh, Yaron is somebody who um, we have both done uh, done debates with in the past. Uh, so he is a extremely known quantity around here uh indeed yeah we've talked to him we've watched him debate numerous uh fourth fifth and sixth parties so yeah i feel i, I feel like we know when to expect the hook you know yeah yeah, yeah. so uh you're on uh, is of course from the ayn rand institute uh he is an objectivist which um you know is which means that he would deny being a libertarian because objectivists don't like that word, but um, it's kind of obviously a species of libertarianism. I mean, that's obviously a word that describes, uh, you know, what they, uh, what they believe in, right? Cause, cause they think that uh, redistribution of property is, is theft and morally unacceptable. And the, uh, the only acceptable role for the state is, uh, in the you know economy is uh, preventing force and fraud and enforcing contracts. Uh, in fact, um, in fact, I've, I've noticed that one sort of peculiarity of objectivists I can't say as I can remember other hearing other libertarians use this exact turn of phrase is that I'll hear them talk about how there should be like a separation between the state and the economy the same way there's a separation between church and state. I always wonder how seriously they mean that, right? Because like, if you actually had a complete separation between the state and the economy, I mean, taken literally, I don't know how that even fits with the sort of minimalistic uh, yeah. night watchman state that they still seem to want, but also taken literally, that would mean that you couldn't have like state back currency and it's unclear that like any sort of market at all would be possible at any real scale. Yeah. I mean, that was like one of the big, one of my favorite things about the 19th century to tell people is that, you know, you, you didn't have federal money for a very long time. And especially in those Western states and territories, it's just banks issuing various kinds of script, you know, and currency backed yeah, by, Maybe almost nothing, you know, like that's like real freedom and currency. Anyway, it's just people losing their shirts continuously. It's you think, you yeah, think right. like how are you going to separate the state from at least the coinage and from standards, you know, and measurements and stuff. There's just so many, even in the minarchist version, so many roles that the state is expected to provide. It's a strange idea to call it a, to call for a separation, even for them. Yeah, and I mean, and that's as much of a disaster as that was. There were bank runs all the time and all that, like. Even so, you still at least had states, right? So there was still government, just like a lower level of government that was doing some of those things. Um, and yeah, I mean, then it like really gets fun when you start thinking about like Ayn Rand's uh, magnum opus, Atlas Shrugged, uh, is, you know, that like the, that John Galt, you know, is, is at like a railway, right? Like a train company. It's like, well, hold up. This is a really fun example, thinking about the relationship yeah. between the state and the economy. Because how exactly are you supposed to have a train system in a in a libertarian utopia like uh, this? I mean, what would the route be like, right? Every time, every time a property owner doesn't feel like selling, I guess you go, you know, like that. Yeah, you can't you can't eminent domain him. That's like that's statism. Yeah. Uh, indeed, the thing I remind, it's, it's the stuff you don't think of, like a huge deal, you know, in European military affairs is that Russia and a few other Eastern territories have a different giant rail gauge than you have in Central and Western Europe. And everything you ship that way has to get removed and put on a different train and it really slows down your evil fascist invasions of the Soviet Union and stuff like that. 
who's going to set the uniform rail gauge? That's a giant pain in the ass. Once you've built a lot with different gauges, no one wants to change. Like only like a central authority can say, fucking, this is the standard. And otherwise the system doesn't work. It's inefficient to change the trains. It's not efficient to have market anarchy all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. I also said, uh, see, Silver is a former objectivist saying in the chat they want a gold standard with notes printed by whoever holds enough gold to do it. So I understand the gold standard part, but like just state involvement in coinage is a much more basic standard than like whether you have a gold standard or fiat money or, you know, bimetallism, right? That's like a fun one from the 19th century, right? You know, that you could have state and, uh, you know, that you could have gold and silver. Like these were all slightly separate questions from like whether the state is involved in like literally printing money or, you know, issuing coins, uh, which has been, you know, pretty much a constant of the market societies that we, that we know about. I mean, I, I guess you could, you know, you could just have private banks doing it and then getting sued if they're doing it fraudulently. And all I could say is have fun with that uh, logistically. Yeah. But, um, in, uh, in any case, uh, let's, uh, let's get to it. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I think this should be a fun combination of people. Yeah. Good cast. We are joined by two of my favorite people to listen to, quite frankly. Matt Brunig, a lawyer by training, is the founder of the People's Policy Project, a progressive think tank which focuses on socialist and social democratic economic ideas, a large chunk of which Matt dedicates to analysis of the welfare state. Matt and his wife also host the low effort and low quality The Brunig's podcast, which you can find on their Patreon. Yarn Brook received his doctorate degree in finance from the University of Texas, later working as a finance professor before co-founding BH Equity Research, private equity and uh, hedge fund management company. Yarn also serves as the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute and as the host of the Yarn Brook Show, which you can find on his YouTube. Matt and Yarn, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us on. Thanks for having me. For sure. Yarn, let's go ahead and start with you. In about a minute or so, does society have a moral obligation to assist non-workers and the poorest among us by providing them collective resources through the state? Is this morally justifiable? And after Yarn is done, Matt, go ahead and jump in with your opening response and rebuttal. And then you're both free to go back and forth as you see fit. Yarn? So, no, um, it, it, it does not. Indeed, I believe that uh, society providing uh, welfare to uh, to a segment of its uh, citizens is immoral, not just is it not moral. But what is, what is morality and what does morality apply to? Morality is fundamentally a, a, a set of ideas, a set of principles that applies to individual behavior. Uh, that which furthers an individual life is the good. That which uh, threatens it, that which uh, suppresses it is bad. The major way in which we as human beings survive, the major way in which we thrive, that, therefore uh, the primary value and virtue uh, in morality is reason and rationality. It's the use of our minds. It's use of our minds to guide our actions in pursuit of those values we need in order to survive, to thrive, to flourish, to do well. That's what the good means. We deal with other people as traders. We trade with them. We, we provide them with values. They provide us with values. Value for value in win-win uh, transactions and win-win uh, relationships. Force, coercion which is necessary if you are going to provide a welfare state. That is, it's necessary if you're going to take money from me and give it to Matt, that requires force. I'm not, you know, if I give it voluntarily, then it's not a welfare state. That requires a coercion. That requires force. Force and coercion are antithetical to human life. They are, uh, they are uh, you know, constraints and ability to think and act based on our own judgment, which is what is necessary for human life, for flourishing human life to be successful. Freedom, freedom from coercion, freedom from force, freedom from uh, authority that imposes itself on us is the essential requirement in a social context for individuals to thrive and be successful. So morality demands that I be left free, free from somebody else's coercion. 
if I choose to help person X, that is my choice. It might be rational. It might not be rational, but that is up to me. To be coerced into helping uh, another human being is morally evil. It is morally wrong. Uh, and uh, therefore, welfare as a system, a system of coercion, a system that imposes the will of the majority, the authoritarian in charge. Uh, I mean, the welfare state ultimately was established by authoritarians, uh, and it has its uh, authoritarian roots in 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 uh, in in, in the history. Um, it is a violation of my uh, of my freedom of my uh, rights, uh, and therefore is fundamentally immoral. I'll stop there. All right, Matt. Welfare is is a lack of freedom. It is authoritarian. What is your response? Yeah, I mean, so this is the um, sort of uh, non-aggression principle style argument against welfare. Uh, the idea here is that uh, the institutions involved in the welfare state, the tax and transfer program, involve coercion and force, and coercion and force are bad. Therefore, the welfare state is bad. The problem, obviously, with this form of argument is that it would apply to every institution in the economy. The economy fundamentally is a way of uh, of allocating scarce goods, right? Distributing scarce goods, and every distribution you can come up with uh, trades off with some other potential distribution. And people disagree about what the appropriate distribution is. And so, if you happen to find yourself in disagreement with the distribution that your economy is uh, using, uh, you will always experience that as force or coercion. Whether it actually is for force or coercion requires you to actually dig a little deeper and ask yourself, what are people owed, right? So let me let me take a step back here and make the argument that uh, under uh, Mr. Uh, Brooks, sorry, Brooke, Brooke. <laughs> under Mr. Brooks' um, uh, reasoning here, if if you don't mind. Yarn's uh, argument here would knock out property itself, right? So let's take a step back. Uh, in the beginning, uh, nothing is owned, obviously. Uh, it just exists in the world. No one has owned anything. Um, and then at some point, something becomes uh, becomes owned, by which it means that you can use violence to expel other people from it. That's force and coercion. If those people don't agree, then you use violence to enforce that upon them. So if we were to you know, take this to its logical end, then, then just uh, the institutions of property themselves need to be discarded. They are antithetical to human life. Um, you know, I don't know where else he wants to go with it, right? But like, if if that's the the path you want to go, you basically are just going to annihilate everything. I think what happens in this debate, and I don't want to jump jump the gun too much here, is we're going to end up debating about entitlement. So what Yaren will is probably doing here, just because I've seen this a hundred times, is he has a certain sense of what people are entitled to. And then anything that deviates from that, the institutions that are used to enforce that deviation is seen as violence and force and coercion. But people disagree on what people are entitled to, right? So in the same way that he might see the welfare state as force and coercion, I would see a lack of welfare state as force and coercion. Why? Because a lack of a welfare state requires the use of force and coercion to prevent people from getting what they are entitled to. So, I mean, I guess what I would say is we need a little bit more from saying it involves force and coercion, right? Or maybe, maybe Yarn and I can join hands here, and the first thing we will do is we can repeal uh, uh, all the property laws and contract laws across all the countries of the world and uh, make sure that no force is involved in the uh, administration of those particular institutions and then see what happens. That would be full human flourishing uh, because there would be the lack of force and coercion that Yarn uh, uh, says is so key. Yeah, I've seen uh, Matt make this argument before that it's uh, it's the property owner that is coercing me by forcing me to pay a dollar for an orange at a store. Our property rights themselves coercive and we're ultimately just making sort of moral intuitive choices with how we arrange the market. After you answer that, Yarn, go into the back and forth, guys. I'll leave it to you for the next hour. Of course not. I mean, it's a ridiculous argument. It, it, it assumes that property just exists. It comes into being. And, and the whole definition of the economy is a wrong definition of an economy. An economy is not concerned with distributing scarce goods. That is a fallacy. Goods don't just exist. They don't just happen to be around us. 
goods are produced and created. Somebody has to act in order to produce goods, in order to create stuff. Life is a process of action. Life is a process of production. And if you don't produce, you, you have nothing. You literally have nothing. So um, life, so, so an economy is the process of production and trade. That's what an economy is. And that's what economy studies. Economics is the field that studies uh, production and trade. Uh, so, uh, you know, so where, do property, where does property come from? Property doesn't just come from, uh, it's not a starting point. Property is that which one produces, that which one gains through one's own effort, through one's own work. That is, property is a product of uh, human mind, human action, the human need to survive and to thrive and to flourish. There is no flourishing without property. There is no, There are no goods without property. The goods are the things that are being produced. And therefore, if you abandon property, well, what you get is anarchy, which is, I guess, Matt is what he supports. But what anarchy is, is what the common person knows what anarchy is. Anarchy is a state of war. Anarchy is a state in which there are no goods, or if there are goods, the force is being used between individuals in order to partake in that property, and gangs roam around stealing from one another, and that is human existence. The idea of property rights is a massive human achievement. And it, it is an achievement that brings us stability and peace and, it's an, and, and progress and, and, uh, and creativity. It's an achievement that at some level, some implicit level, almost every society has. And it, once uh, the society has an advanced conception of property, as Western societies have had at least since John Locke, uh, that leads to massive economic growth and massive economic prosperity, and and everybody, everybody, literally everybody, is uh, uh, better off. And no, I'm 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 not concerned about entitlement. I'm concerned about property. I'm concerned. All right. Uh, this is this is probably a good place to, uh, especially because they said they're going to go into relatively unmoderated back and forth after this this is probably as good a place as any to uh to do the first pause because uh because matt and Yaron have both uh have both laid out their uh their sort of core positions or 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 at least you know Yaron has right like matt is matt is really just like poked a pretty big logical hole in it he hasn't really said much yet about his own positive views but um but rob initial thoughts yeah, uh, classic stuff, you know, uh, so, some of these are, you know, evergreen bits, like, you know, we interact in markets with win-win transactions, and they're always really keen to rush to that. Make Every time you make a deal, you've never felt bad about it or screwed ever. That has never happened. You feel great about it because all people are equals in the market, which, is, I mean, it's just kind of funny, you know, when you look at the yeah. scale of property that a single person may own. John Rockefeller, he controls the energy economy of the Western Hemisphere. And he, him and some 19th century New York street orphan, when he pays him a penny for a shoe shine, that's an equal. That's a win-win. It's everyone's winning here. It's a way of avoiding looking at distribution. And it's funny because Euron says it's not just about distribution of goods. And I did see when Brunig said, you know, economics is the distribution of goods. I was like, oh, he's walking into a an easy counterpunch here because of course like your own is right to the extent that economics like goods don't just occur i mean many of them do like actually a large amount of them do anything natural natural resources a giant part of the economy i mean yes they naturally do occur it is true so it's partially he's just wrong but to the extent we produce goods like it's usually the left that wants to focus production in economics and talk about the power relationships that creates economic patterns like scale efficiencies, which just require in the market that you get giant firms and their owners become insanely rich and they buy your land for a penny after threatening you with a gang they hire to expand their property rights. Like that's what we had in the minarchist era of US government, especially in the 19th century, you know? So thinking through these different premises, like they contradict each other, you know, leads us to the world of market power and big concentrated markets that we have. I just always want to remind these guys, like we had what they wanted in America in the 19th century. Yeah, no labor laws, no labor unions, you know? 
uh, you don't have the Federal Reserve. You don't have income taxes. Very little regulation in that era. It's, America was famous for that. And what do you get? You know, you get monopolist in industry after industry. Just these towering figures. You know, J.P. Morgan, the person, not the bank, uh, bailed out the U.S. government two times. That's powerful. I don't know if I would have an equal transaction with Mr. Morgan necessarily. You know, and I like to focus on the production of goods and who tells who to produce. I would just finish. I like that Brunig kind of turns it on his head there and yeah. says it's property rights that are authoritarian. Someone's got to keep all those hobos off that group of that <laughs> patch of land you own. You want to put condos on someday. What do you do? You call the authority agency, whether it's the Chinese Communist Party or American cops, and you throw them off. Like that's the yeah. that's a huge amount of authoritarianism. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I, I I think that I think that Matt was being a little bit playful in how he put it at the end with the, you know should we should we join hands to you know to to reject all property laws and contract laws anywhere everywhere in the world uh, is of course not what he actually uh what he actually advocates but i think i think his his core point is is absolutely right and i mean i think the the sort of core of the argument is pretty unassailable right so it's like okay uh Fair enough, right? Uh, the questions we're arguing about, we argue about how economy should work, is about how goods should be produced and distributed. Fair enough, right? But um, but certainly one of the questions is what's a just distribution of goods? And I, I feel like it's not uncommon for a certain kind of libertarian um, – and you know, I know that's not the preferred term, but I'm just going to continue offensively calling him that because I, th I think it's I think it's analytically useful uh, to remind you know, put him in that I think category. Would take your side, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but that the uh, that that a certain kind of libertarian that you're on is 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 one of um, has a sort of series of Pavlovian reactions to certain words like distribution and entitlement. Uh, but of course they have views about what distribution should be, who's entitled to what, right? They just don't, they just don't like applying those words to those views because once you start saying, well, this is a theory of what counts as a legitimate entire redistribution of goods or how goods should be distributed, who's entitled to what, then you're down on all fours with all the other competing theories and they don't like that, right? They want to just say, no, 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 this is just like, this is just the obvious thing. And then like, there are people who are trying to disturb the order of nature, right? It's not that I have like one view about who should get what, and you have a different view about who should get what, um, that there's just the way things are. And then you, you crazy people who want to interfere with it. But of course, keep things the way they are is a view about who should get what, right? Uh, it's just, well, it's, it's just keep the status quo and in, intact. Right? That is a view about, how good should be distributed um, that, you know, just, just let the, the chips fall where they may in a free market, right? That is a theory of, uh, of, of entitlement, right? Of who is entitled to what, that people are entitled to whatever they get from a series of free market transactions. That's a theory of entitlement. And yeah. it's different from what, you know, he hasn't actually laid it out because he's having too much fun poking holes in, in your aunt's thing, but um, you know, just from my general Brunig knowledge, right, that the, uh, you know, Matt's view of who should get what is like a Rawlsian view that, you know, he thinks that, um, you know, you should, um, that, uh, that, you know, the a just distribution of goods is one that everybody would sign on to from behind the uh, veil of ignorance, right? You don't know if you're going to be born into a poor family or a rich one. You don't know if you're going to have the particular set of aptitudes that'll help you climb the ladder of a class structure, et cetera. Uh, then what distribution of goods would you want? Right? Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's I'd, not a, like, I know Matt's like Twitter, Avi for the longest time might still be, I don't remember, uh, is, is a picture of John Rawls, um, which I remember hilariously once led somebody I saw on Twitter to be like, uh, to say to his wife, Liz, oh my God, there's such an age gap there. It's like, that's a picture of, picture of John Rawls. Uh, yeah. But, um, but yeah, this is, so that's so that's Matt's view. Euron's view is people are entitled to whatever they can get 
in a free market process. Those are two theories of entitlement, whether you want to call them that or not. Um, a third theory of entitlement that Euron has floated here, although he, I think in a very not entirely conscious way, is a labor theory of entitlement, that people are entitled to whatever they produce. Yeah, property, it's, yeah, it's always something you worked on. It's always a homestead theory. It's, it's not, it doesn't just happen. I did work. So it belongs to me. Oh, interesting. So labor, interesting. I see. What if I do labor for someone else because I need to feed Junior? That, but then he gets that. I don't get that. So sometimes labor you do is property, and sometimes it's a billionaire's property. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and so that's the thing. If you really take seriously a labor theory of entitlement, that what matters is that you know you are the one who personally produced something. Uh, then actually taking that seriously would lead you pretty straightforwardly to, to an anti-capitalist conclusion, right? Yeah, that, so. um, you know, who, you know, who deserves the profits of General Motors, you know, the, who's entitled to them, the people who make and sell the cars or people who own shares of, uh, of, of General Motors, right? Um, who, you know, who's, who, who's producing the, you know, the services of Amazon, the, you know, shipping all the packages around the world, you know, people at the warehouses are Jeff Bezos. Now, I, I mean, as a matter of fact, I don't fully buy into a labor theory of entitlement. I think that like people who can't work, for example, yeah. right, are, are, are entitled to, to goods, children, retirees, uh, you know, et cetera, right? So I, I think it is a little bit more complicated for that and a few other reasons, but if you did have a pure labor theory of entitlement, that would not go where you're on once, which is why it's not really a labor theory of entitlement. It's really a whatever the market decides uh, theory of entitlement, which is a very different thing, right? Yeah. That you, that, you know, and this is, this is the point. This is, I guess this is kind of what you were saying earlier about, you know, the idea that we're all making equal transactions in the, the market, right? I mean, this is, this is a bar big, you know, this is like half of Karl Marx's point in capital that, um, that, you know, capitalism is like feudalism in the sense that these are both societies where the immediate producers, the people who are actually like tilling the fields or, you know, making products in factories don't, don't enjoy the, you know, anything close to the full product of their labor. Of course, even in a socialist society, they wouldn't enjoy the full product because the problem I just laid out, right? But they have a, but that it's also like feudalism, Marx thinks, because um, there's a there's a relationship of class domination that it's not just like, okay, we'll all vote to set aside some some money for the retirees, but that, you know, if you're if you're Jeff Bezos, you can just take some as a result of your structural position, you know, given capitalist uh, property relations that, you know, so Marx's argument is that, no, we, it looks like, you know, there's this surface legal form that we're all legal equals, but in practice, um, in practice, we have a class society, the way feudalism is a class society, the way slavery was a class society, a society in which the immediate producers have no choice, but to, to give up a big chunk of what they produce to uh to to the ruling class but you know the only the other thing i want to say is because i think i think maybe sometimes people who are seeing this argument for the first time don't quite get it the sort of core point that matt is making about what's wrong with Euron's argument which is that because the core point is that whatever you think about these different theories of like just entitlement are people entitled to things because that's just how the market process played out? Are they entitled to things because they're labor? Are they entitled to things because this is the fair, what we would all recognize as a fair distribution if we didn't know how much of it we were going to get, right? Um, whatever you think about that question, coercion is just a red herring, right? That's that's Matt's point. That, that you know, look, any any conceivable distribution of goods, um, like scarce resources, any conceivable system for distributing f scarce resources, by definition, has to be backed up with coercion. Because if not everybody can use something at the same time, then either you just have grab what you can that, you know, which 
you have anarchy, which Euron hilariously go into a consequentialist argument. Oh, look how bad the consequences would be. Uh, has you know has just railed against uh, anarchy. And man, if if consequences were on the table, that's bad news about Euron's vision of how the world should work, right? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Like you know, if we could say, yeah, sure. It's something involves coercion, but the coercion is justified because otherwise the human consequences would be so bad. Man, have I got a story to tell you about poverty and inequality and the consequences of those things. Uh, but you know, if but if you're gonna have a stable system for deciding who gets to use scarce resources, that's coercive by its nature. That they that uh, that not everybody is allowed to 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 use everything, right? That they have a that so whether you're enforcing an existing distribution that results from a free market or you're using nationalizations or taxation or any other tool to do a redistribution, either way, right? On both of these scenarios, it still remains the case that you're coercively enforcing whatever the, the distribution is, at least if coercion is, is meant in like a normal neutral way, right? Like where, like, because you can you can go two ways here. You can either just say coercion or force just means like making somebody do something they don't want to do with the implied threat of 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 you know violence, state action, right? I think that's the normal way of using those words. But then yeah. a lot of times um libertarians will default to the sort of moralized sense. What well, only counts as coercion if the thing you're forcing somebody to do violates their rights. Um, and which is a little silly, like GA Cohen has a great point about this. It's like, well, hold on. If we, if we use words like coercion and force that way, then the serial killer isn't being forced to stay in jail, right? Like I mean, <laughs> justified coercion is still coercion, right? But even if you do use coercion in this silly way at this point, and this is the second part of the point Matt was making, at that point, if coercion is being used only to mean like immoral coercion, then well, whether or not egalitarian redistribution is immoral, it you know counts as coercion. Just depends on whether it's immoral, and whether it's immoral can't be established by talking about coercion, or else you're arguing in a circle, right? Like whether it's immoral has to depend on which substantive theory of entitlement you subscribe to. Is it the Rawlsian theory? Is it some even more egalitarian theory than Rawls, like G.A. Cohen? Is it like a labor theory of entitlement? Is it some sort of libertarian, however the chips fall in a free market theory of entitlement? Like, that's the real issue. I mean, the, the coercion thing is just kind of, uh, is just the libertarian rhetorical version of a, you know, magician trying to get you to look at his, you know, uh, look at his lips instead of his hands. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. And I think, yeah, speaking to that question of, you know, it's coercion in any system of distribution. I mean, it's scarce goods, whether you're relatively rich or relatively poor in time and place. You never have infinite goods. And this is always what we economists teach. You know, just last week I was teaching this to a new class. That's the kind of existential reality as it's seen in economics is we don't have unlimited goods. You have a natural bounty, but if you want, you know, anything fancy like clothes or transportation or energy or entertainment, you know, it'll take production of goods and it'll take, you know, you don't want coercion wrecking that. Like the way they view coercion is just simply like related to that question of private property, which is not coercion, even though it relies on it like everything else. But it's like how he says at the very beginning, oh, yes, you know, when you have these welfare programs imposed on people against their will by, and he goes, majorities, authoritarians, <laughs> like just like not even a sentence fragment connecting those just majorities, dot, 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 authoritarians, you know, a giant majority of poor people getting an equal share or Hitler, you know, similar things. Uh, like it, it shows just how instrumental, yeah, this idea of this usage of coercion is. Like it's just so kind of nakedly disingenuous. Uh, so I like that point of yours. And yeah, also that is sort of, as you were saying before, kind of the classic hallmark of objectivism relative to the other schools. I mean, people are all kind of prone to thinking that their opinion is better than the spectrum of opinion. But usually when they engage, they'll be, okay, I see it differently. I'm on the right, you're on the left, whatever. But the objectivism just to say, oh yeah, you guys have views. We have the like logical truth that we deduced while I was in the shower, I deduced whether, why it's wrong for me to have to pay taxes so a black kid can go to school on the other side of town. That's, I realized why it's wrong. 
just it's just uh, yeah a priori i need not hear your your piddling little arguments those arguments that's subjectivism this is objectivism we don't we don't yeah that. yeah i mean i mean that's right like that's just uh that's just a way of of uh banging the, the shoe on the table like Khrushchev, right? Uh, that's, you know. That, Another friend of the show. Yeah, friend of the show, Nikita. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, look, I see that in the in the chat, the, uh, you know, the people are calling for more Brunig. So uh, that's, um, uh, so let's go back to the debate. So it's about creating and building and making and achieving. So, so goods and services are produced, certainly, um, but that's a different thing from property, right? Property yeah. is the institution that's used to this to say this belongs to this person, this belongs to that person, right? Yeah. If I produce something, it doesn't necessarily mean that I get to exclude it from other people. That's an institution. Now, maybe you agree with that institution, but I the, the jumping off point for the debate was you saying you're against force, you're against force, you're against force. Right. Well, I mean, quite 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 obviously, if I Quite obviously, if I if I go walk into uh, the grocery store over here and yeah. pull something off the uh, off the the shelf, I walk on out. Not what, and then someone tackles me. You stole this. Well, who's done the force? I've not you done have. any force. I haven't touched anybody. Of course you have. They touched you, me. Of course you have. They who did I who did I use force on? I mean, it is funny to assume that force only entails touching one another. Uh, there are many ways in which we can force one another. Force and what tail. Did I force anyone to do? Any human being to do? I didn't tell anyone to do anything. I didn't threaten anyone to do it. I literally just moved an object. Yeah, no, not a person. Not a person. Just an, an object. object that wasn't yours. You, you, you inverting high up. Why here. wasn't it mine? Putting logical high. The law, you right? Mean, you the force of the state. The you didn't produce it. Forget the law. You did not okay. produce it. So it's All not. I grew the orange. Wait, wait, wait. I grew the orange. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Just because I grew the orange and I've accumulated oranges. They are my oranges. This is the origin of property. The origin of property is something I produced and now I get to control. When you take something of mine that I produce, you are using force against me. So you see how we've moved into entitlement here, right? So first it was I'm against force, I'm against coercion. I give you an example. Where, in a kind of literal sense, I didn't use any force, but the property enforcer used force against me. And then you go, oh, that's not actually force because it was forced, used in a way that is consistent with my theory of entitlement. What's my theory of entitlement? My theory of entitlement is if you produce it, it belongs to you and you can use force to keep everyone else away from it. So force and coercion has fallen out. It's not a theory, have of, a theory entitlement. of entitlement. The right. theory of entitlement is a is a dessert based theory of entitlement that says if I produce it, it belongs to me, and that's okay. And I'm happy to shift in there. I'll let you talk here, but that is set, force and coercion is gone. You're just saying, just like everyone else, you're willing to use violence to make sure that people get what they are owed. You have a certain sense of what they are owed based on this dessert based theory of if you produce it, it's yours, and then that that's it. Right. But then we will go into that question of whether that dessert based theory is a good one. But I'll let you talk. Dessert based theory is the only theory there is. Every other theory is a theory uh, that negates morality. So, again, if you <laughs> set up morality as awesome. uh, that which is required for human life, for individual human life, if you set up morality as to in order to in order to survive as a human being, one needs the thing can produce and uh, that the product of one's labor is one's own. That is the essential, that is the essential parameters of a moral code. Uh, once you ignore that, then morality is out the window. It's a then, then it really becomes, then it really becomes force. Who has the bigger guns? Who has the bigger gang? Who has the biggest majority to force one group to give to another or to distribute wealth or to distribute anything based on the arbitrary decisions of whomever? That is a violation of morality. I thought we were talking about morality here. Yeah, yeah, we are, we are. So morally, morally, what I produce is mine. That's it. Okay. There is no entitlement. Yes, there is just a fact of reality that this thing, this until, you know, until I grew the oranges, there was no oranges. Those oranges, mm -hmm. the, the essential uh, uh, meaning of ownership is those are mine because really, I produce them. There's really nothing for, more to that. Really quick for the people in the audience, because... Um, yeah. um, just to insert a quick explanation. So 
essentially what Yarin is saying is that uh, and how it links to the welfare debate is that in order to have welfare, you essentially have to have taxes, right? And so when you tax people, you're taking their property and sort of redistributing it to other people. And that's where the example of, you know, taking an orange from a store without the consent of the owner comes in. Like fundamentally, can you do that? Can you take someone's property and distribute it to someone else using the coercion of the state? Um, just an explanation for the audience. Matt, what's your response? It, it doesn't have to be coercion of state. The, the Stallone can stop you. And indeed, uh, you know, what this leads to is, of course, a, a state of, as I said, violence uh, by everybody. Because once you enter a store and take an orange, you are starting force. And force will be met with force. The, uh, so I, I just for clarity purposes, and I'm going to go into dessert. I just want to reiterate it here. There's some conceptual confusion here where you are defining force by referring back to your theory of entitlement. I know you don't like that word, because you, but your theory of dessert. Of, You're saying of, force of, is anything that yeah. force is anything that is contrary to my theory of dessert-based distributions. No, and in that case, get rid of the force stuff, right? Just fundamentally, if I go grab an orange off a shelf, that is not force, unless we read into the word force Yarin's entire theory, entire theory of property and who belong, and what belongs to who, right? <laughs> Only if we do that, in which case that's fine. But then let's go back into the the lower level argument about property and what belongs to. So I want to take this orange example. Okay, so we want to say each person is owed what they produce. This is the sort of labor dessert idea. No, okay? I mean stop this, stop this. I say nobody owes anything to anybody. I don't. I, nobody owes somebody. It is stuff. moral and just for each person to get what they uh, produce. Let's put it that way. Okay. Here we go. So, how do we know what each person produces? Now, we have, I'm, you're, you're an economist. You are you're, you're, you're somewhat similar. I don't know exactly, but you you know about the production function, right? We've got uh, a lot of inputs go into to output, and one of those inputs, of course, is is nature. And the orange tree is a good example of this, right? We got the sun. We got water, we got soil. Uh, none of that is produced. That actually is what then goes in and makes the material of the orange. All physical items are made up of material that no human being produced. So who is entitled to those physical items? Now, I know you're going to say, hey, we add value. We add value on top of the basic raw materials. Sure, okay, fine. But the raw materials still are there. I don't consent to you being able to use those raw materials. You didn't ask me. And so how can you be entitled to them? You don't produce them. But they're not yours. They, 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 well, they're not mine. They're not yours. It's as uh, a Proudhon says. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they should go. They should belong to their producer. Who produced them? God. <laughs> Therefore, proprietor retire. Right. That was the whole sort of Christian idea at the time. Right. But um, Not a Christian. I don't believe in God. That's I understand. But you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. You don't produce any of the material uh, substrate that goes into any of the stuff. And therefore, by what right do you exclude me from that? You didn't produce it either, and I've taken the material of reality, and I've reshaped it to produce something new. Something but I don't want I don't want you to have the input. I don't even want you to have the input. I want to use it, but, but, but I can't now because now you've put it into a, a tree, a house, or something. Sure, you can you can deny me the inputs, and we go to war, and whoever wins will have the inputs. I mean, that's you've you've relegated human oh. beings. You've relegated human beings to the level of animals, where we are where we are challenging now. I, I, the way I define inputs is the way I gain ownership over inputs is by using them. Once I use those inputs, they become mine. And once that's, that's the way we define a property over land. Once I fence it off and cultivate it, it becomes mine. It is the cultivation. It's the use of those inputs that makes those inputs mine and no longer, and no longer and yours. And suppose it, I disagree. Suppose I disagree. I say, Hey, Hey, no, no, that's that's not your input. Like, uh, let's give land a, a good example here. You start growing stuff on it, and I come in with my buddies, and we start playing Frisbee. And you say, hey, you can't play Frisbee here. It's my land. And I'm like, well, says who? 
You're like, well, I started using it. I'm like, I don't care. I've, I've always been playing. I wanted to play Frisbee here. You did, it's, did you make the land? No? Okay, so what's the deal? But and all not. you have in response is you go, well, if we don't just basically just pretend that whoever used it first has some entitlement to it, then it'll cause lots of conflict. Sure, right? We all have to go along with rules in order to avoid conflict. But what is the, what is the moral reason why? Moral reason. Moral- which no human being created. Reason. You get to exclusively use it. And if I go and just dare to walk on it, you get to violently attack me. I, I, I took I took these resources and I reshaped them. I did something with them. That makes the mind. That is and what I disagree. That's what you Yeah. I mean I, I think one way of um that I often find it's useful to sort of succinctly try to express uh, the point that, you know, Matt's making here. And of course, Matt is one of the main people that I've learned this point from uh, in the, uh, in the past, but is, is just to say, okay, look, if you think like in the orange example, you take the orange off the shelf and then you walk out without pain, right? If you think that you've, that counts as an act of force, Right. Well, what what makes it force? I mean, again, it's certainly not force in the normal and intuitive sense, right? That you're, you know, you're making somebody do something, or you're using violence, you're threatening to use violence. Got a but, gun to like, their head. Yeah, but in the in the special moral way of using the word force, where force just means violating somebody's rights, right? That they that in that sense you're initiating the use of force, and so therefore if somebody uses force to stop you right? Security guard tackles you or whatever that that's justified. Okay. Well, if you're saying it's violating, it's forced because it's violating property rights. Well, what, you know, that because the orange isn't yours, that the orange belongs to not actually, none of these people actually believe that it belongs to the person who grew it. Right. The, uh, that, uh, yeah. the, you know, that like, you know, the, the person who grew it was an extremely underpaid Mexican migrant who, you know, is, is, uh, is definitely not losing out of this trend. you know, this, this series of events, but. Yeah, exempt uh, even from American labor law, even American labor law does not extend to them. That should tell you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Um, but the, the person, you know, but like you're saying, well, you know, the, the owner of the store, Right, that this counts as initiating force in this special counterintuitive, special moral way of using the word force. It counts as you as initiating force because you're violating their their rights because the orange is is theirs. Well, a very succinct way of, of framing this is just to say, well, look, what do we mean by theirs? Right? Like, what do we mean by say it's their orange? Say, well, they have a right to it, a property right. Well, what kind of right are we talking about? Um one straightforward thing you might mean is a legal right. And I think in practice, in everyday intuitive contexts, when somebody says, oh, this belongs to me, that belongs to you, I think what they actually are talking about is legal rights. But um, but in the but it, if it means if what you mean when you say it's their orange is legally it's their orange, okay, well, maybe that grounds your objection to the shoplifter. But if the the fruit store is like nationalized, then it, it certainly can't ground your objection to that. You can't say, oh, nationalizing the fruit store is um, is theft because it's no longer legally the property, right? If a socialist government has passed a law saying that fruit stores are going to be publicly owned now, right? It's no longer legally the, the property of the former owner, right? Now it's legally the property of, you know, the public at large. So, yeah, so well, what, what if you steal TP from a school or water from an Amtrak train? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's Public like, oh, okay. Right. Like, you know, like if you, if when you say it's theirs, they have a right to it. What you mean is it's legally theirs. Then, okay. Then you can explain how the shoplifter has violated property rights, but you can't explain how the socialist government that nationalized this, the orange store has yeah. violated property rights because it's no longer legally theirs. So what you must mean is that it's morally theirs that like, it's uh, that they, that, you know, it's like, it's, it's morally unjust to take it. Right. But hold on. What makes it morally unjust? Well, it can't be 
the word coercion or theft or anything like that can't appear in your explanation of what makes it morally unjust or you've gone around in a circle, right? That's right. So, because you said, well, it's it counts as force because you're violating their rights. Well, what makes it a violation of their rights? What makes it morally right for the store owner to have it rather than, you know, for the state to nationalize it? That can't be it, right? So uh, it has to be something else. And, you know, and it's, it's the question, you know, of what is it? It's like, well, you know, he mentioned John Locke earlier, right? Like in the first part we watched, um, Iran said, you know, well, just about every society has had some kind of concept of property rights. And then we've had advanced concepts of property rights since about John Locke. Uh, and mm. um, which is, is fascinating for a lot of reasons uh, that, uh, cause I, yeah, I'm so curious about how you're on feels about non-advanced property rights, but, um, but like <laughs> also, also, um, one, let's talk about the time of John Locke, right? This is a time when a lot of capitalist property relations are being created by, uh, people by feudal ar aristocrats turning themselves into modern capitalists by violently driving peasants off their land. Um, but two, it's like, okay, what's John Locke's theory? I mean, Locke says, you know, is pretty much what you're on said that, you know, that you, that you change something, you know, you rearrange it with your labor and that makes it yours, which, um, I mean, I really liked, I saw somebody in the chat. I was like, okay, I rearranged the orange by, you know, changing its physical location, you know, when I, when I put it in my pocket, right? But, uh, <laughs> you know. it's trans transporting it out, it's, it's a service. Yeah. Um, but like also, I don't know. I mean, it's like Locke's view, like Locke's justification, if you actually bother to read Locke, is one that Iran would not accept, right? That like Locke's justification is everything is originally owned by God, but God has benevolently set it up such that, you know, we can, um, you know, we can then have it transferred to us by labor mixing as long, by the way, Locke has this proviso, as long as you leave as much and as good for everybody else, which is a really interesting one to think about now, but uh, like, uh, but like, I don't know. It's like, that's like, well, you mixed your labor with it. So therefore it's yours. I mean, quite aside from the fact that your average corporate um, overlord has done very little personal labor mixing. Like, I just don't, I, I just don't understand like this just on the face of it doesn't seem very plot. Like this has always just seemed like not that different from like the theory of property rights that like little boys have when they're arguing about who, who gets something. And one of them like spits I on saw it, it first like, yeah. or I saw it first or I spit on it or like, the canine theory of property rights that, you know, that you get it by mixing your pee with it. You know, it's like, what, yeah, what, I peed on it. what like, w why should I believe that theory of property rights? Well, you can tell me it's objective all day long, but like, what's, what's the reason why I'm supposed to believe it? Yeah. Uh, I, we're too subjective to get it, I guess. That's embarrassing for us. Uh, but yeah, like I, that's a really interesting, you know, little nexus of subjects there. I really like that, which is amazing too. Yeah. Like I mixed my labor with it. So it's mine. Yeah. But I go to the factory and I mix my labor with shit all damn day and I don't get any of that. I get like a check for a small fraction of the value of those goods there. And I mean, you know, and who gets that value? Well, of course it's, you know, maybe a CEO who works, you know, Elon Musk, he sleeps in the factory cause he works so hard. Wow, on the assembly line. No, no. He tells people to tell people to work on the assembly line. So hard, he tells them, though. Wow, he works so hard. It's all on the face of it, kind of absurd. But, of course, most of that value goes to those investors, you know, who are sitting around, whether they're, you know, retirees with a pension or, you know, Bernard Arnault and his investment uh, property portfolio that's made him one of the richest billionaires in establishments and businesses he's never been to stores he's never visited brands he's never used but it's your property because well he did work in the past so he deserves to buy these shares and it's his transmuted value okay so it's transmuted further i see <laughs> such a contingent just such a contingent yeah picture of what is coercion and what is desserts i work all day in this place and i'm still poor and the owner is rich but i don't have any desserts 
his kids who have never worked here ever, they have five free new cars. That's their just desserts. It just seems like as you, yeah, you know, it's a market based theory of, you know, you get it, it's yours. You deserved it. That's, that's how that happened. And especially of course, the best part of all though, nobody owes anyone, anything to anyone. <laughs> so the United States is getting into a new debt crisis now. Like a big Wall Street Journal headline this week was, where are tax refund checks going? It's tax time. People love those refund checks. Where are they going? In the debt hole was the Wall Street Journal headlines phrasing. Rupert Murdoch let that go by. I can't believe it. But that's, you know, like that's the reality. It's like people owe everything, everyone. We owe it to this tiny class of rich people, yeah, whose ancestors threw all the peasants off their land. And 50 generations later, oh, look, you're still in charge just with fancier products. I see. Okay. But somehow it's your desserts. That's that's best. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it is it like, like it gets further further and further from any sort of like, like he gets all this rhetorical force out of the labor entitlement claim. But the more you actually think about how it's supposed to apply to the property rights he believes in, you get more yeah. and more connections away from actual, from actual lock in labor mixing. I know. Yeah. It's like a labor theory of value, but you hate labor and you love their evil. Like you, you love Mr. Burns yelling at Homer, not Homer. So how are you telling me that the work creates the value? Like your equity and owning it in the eyes of the law. And yeah, the coercive property rights to let you enforce that. Like that's, like that's the crux of that. Yeah, okay. and, and I mean this 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 whole idea that uh, they uh, nobody owes anything to anybody. It's like um, I, don't I don't like why why am I supposed to think that? Like I I have um, like in the like a lot of objectivist rhetoric. In fact, in Euron's debate with me, right? It's like, well, you know, I don't believe in you know. God or heaven or hell or reincarnation or any of that stuff. So I think this is the only life that I have to live. It's like, so, you know, I, I should be able to, to get everything I can out of it. It's like, yeah, okay. But given those same premises, everybody else also has the one life. And so if we can like raise your taxes by 1% and somebody else gets to go to college, um, like wouldn't that, those same objective facts about reality give us a reason to to do that. I've, I've never, I've never understood that. He also said so. Silver is uh, doing a callback to that debate at the end of this. He says, "Ben and Rob, if you don't understand it, you haven't contemplated how it logically follows from a and a, a equals a hard enough. Uh, you were probably distracted by wanting your on's television, which was uh, there was a point where." in my debate with him where I said, socialists don't have a problem with personal property. Nobody's going to try to take your television. And he was like, no, 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 you, you would. And, and he, uh, he had this whole thing about like the kibbutz where he grew up. People didn't have, like you only had the television in the common room, not in the private rooms or something. Um, but like, really like I will put it in writing if it'll make him feel better. There are no circumstances <laughs> in which I'm going to try to expropriate your aunt's television. Yeah. I, yeah, that ought to reassure him. I hope it does. You know, I appreciate Silver's point earlier uh, as well. You know, because I always rush to bring up Monopoly and how godforsakenly powerful these people become very quickly with the fruits of other people's labor that does not belong to their desserts. Uh, they become so big at monopolies, insanely rich billionaires, and so on. She made the point like every libertarian, including Ayn Rand, has all these like super uh, flimsily rationalized oh, well, the government touched that market once. So it's tainted now, and any gigantic evil monopolist who crushes the face of orphan children, well, that's, you know, the government charged him a penny for a business license. So they ruined that market. That's corrupted now. Uh, that's an important point because these guys will always have some, you know, you have to bring up several industries in a row or they'll like ad hoc a policy from the Commerce Department that boosts business mostly. They'll find some hindrance and blame all the monopolies on that. I just want to re return to what a good point that was. Uh, but I do, I'm really enjoying this one. I do have to say that you were right, Ben. This is like, uh, you know, this is a great one. Brunick's really fun. Like it's a lot of this time, it just feels like he's toying with Brooke. Uh, it's like, oh, okay, let's talk about this. Like he's so, he's so at ease. It's uh, enjoyable. Yeah. And you disagree and therefore, we will fight over it. And if but, we but, but notice, notice, the, notice, we can form a society, we can form a society in which we can agree that what is mine, what I create is mine, and what you create is yours, then we are in a society in which we're in constant warfare. And I would argue that the welfare state is, is to some extent, 
to some extent, such a society. We're in constant warfare because we've we've not accepted what's my mind and what's yours, yours. And we're constantly trying to convince enough people to vote to take your stuff and give it to me and to take my stuff and give it to you. And that's the state of warfare that civilization should be seeking in order to avoid. And the moral claim is that in order to live in society, we have to define rights. I mean, I could say the same. Look, I don't like you. I don't. Let's say I don't like you. You know, I, I haven't met you, but I don't like you. So I decide Probably to shoot you. So I decide to shoot you. Sure. So what? Right. So that would be violence against a person, right? And 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 I get you saying, oh well, I don't, I don't care, I don't care. Why is violence against a person? Oh, wrong. Right. So, well, here, so here's what I want to do. Violence say, against let, a person and violence against the work, the effort, the product of what a person has created. If if we are beings that need to create in order to survive, we can't survive without mm-hmm. creating stuff then isn't the product that I create part of who I am? And therefore, violence against me is the same as violence against the stuff that I created in order for myself to thrive and succeed as a human being. So so people people committing violence against me by stealing my orange because you committed violence against the stuff that I have created that is necessary for my survival, my thriving. You're threatening my life, and therefore you're inflicting violence on me. So Right, but watch, 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 I can run... Shooting somebody and stealing his stuff is is morally equivalent. Watch, I could take the same premises here, and I can I can reach the same conclusions, right? Okay, you need to produce stuff in order to live, right? Mm-hmm. You need um, uh, natural inputs in order to produce stuff. Therefore, when you go and you, you unilaterally grab natural inputs and then exclude them from me, you are taking a shot at my life. Not a gun to the head, but taking the stuff I need to live. This is why, of course, you know, John Locke has his famous proviso, right? You have to leave enough in common for others and so on and so forth, right? That's okay. Um, No, I mean, this is a silly argument. You know, uh, nature exists out there for us to exploit. As individuals, we go out there and exploit it. Some of us do a good job at it. Some of us don't. That's it. And get there first, and therefore I die. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nature. Because you took something you didn't produce. But I did produce it. I reshaped mm. that but material. The, the it was input cool. you didn't produce. But the input if, you didn't produce. If with it, then it's not mine. But once I do something with it, it becomes mine. And it, again, any system that engages this. Any Even if system, that kills me. Any, Even if that kills me. Absolutely. Any system that negates that is a system that will kill all of us. And so you can you can kill me by by strategically placing fences. I don't kill things. But if I were to go in and grab a little ear of corn, die. Now I'm doing violence to you. No, nobody nobody actually dies from me using resources. You might die because you don't have enough creativity or enough uh, you know uh, motivation or enough energy to actually use the resources available. There is an infinite amount of resources, natural resources in the world. There's no shortage of resources. Infinite. This is why this is why this whole idea of scarce goods is bizarre, right? There's no scarcity. There is abundance, and then the question is, who capitalizes on that abundance and who doesn't? And if you don't choose to capitalize on the abundance, then you suffer the fate you suffer. So let me take a step back to the point about rules, right? So here, here's why I push this point so hard because. You know, your reaction is to say, okay, look, um, if you don't like the fact that I can initially appropriate things that I never produced, which does seem to be a little bit at odds with my whole kind of theory of, uh, you know, moral dessert. None um, of that they said. If, if you don't like that, right, I'm putting that in parentheses. You, you, if you don't you, like that, which that is would have I, a... That would that would have negative consequences because then essentially we would have conflicting approaches. Yeah, yeah. You said, look, we would just be in a, a world of chaos because you would be able to say, hey, that's mine. And I would say, no, it's not. And we would never be able to have disagreements over the, the natural inputs. We would never be able to have agreement over natural inputs. And then it would just be ruinous battle. Right. OK. So this, I think, is one of the sort of first decent arguments for the welfare state, which is. Maybe you come to me and you say, hey, I want to have a thing where first come, first serve, 
first person on this fertile piece of land, they get to keep it forever, exclude it from everyone, including people, by the way, who are not even born, who didn't even have a chance to plant their flag. We get to exclude this from them forever. Okay. And I go, I don't know, man, that seems a little much. Did you make that land? No. Okay. I don't know. It seems odd, but here I'll strike you a deal. Okay. Cause it's not, I don't want to fight you over this land forever and ever. Like you point out that's a losing proposition for everyone. So how about this? I'll let you appropriate that land. You can, you can produce things, whatever. In exchange, I want to create a rule where uh, a second rule, right? So the first rule is you get, you know, first come, first serve on natural resources. The second rule is we're going to contribute to a general pot, make sure everyone uh, has kind of their basic needs met so that no one dies as a function of that initial exclusion. And then I say, just come to me we'll meet in the middle on this we'll have a good society you can have your land everyone will be taken care of and then i won't fight you about it yeah but of course you'll fight me about it right because why would you want that minimal why that minimal is always going to increase it always has uh oh, the you'll demand particulars. We'll fight the particulars but the basic yeah. structure we can agree to we'll constantly we'll constantly fight it's it's you know we've done this this is exactly kind of the trade-off that we have in the world today, and it's a disaster. But um, no, but I, as a you, disaster. You, what's striking to me is how obsessed you are with land and how obsessed you are with this idea that nothing is done on this land. It's some, some kind of natural resource that somebody took. Uh, when, when that is all just bizarre, human beings uh, use the land. It is the use of the land. Indeed, we have, even today in our laws, that if you stop losing land, you abandon the land for a certain period of time, it, it anybody could take it, right? It, it, it becomes. Do you agree with those laws? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, I think that, I think the. How the many theory, years? We're going to fight forever, Yaren. Is it 20 years, 30 years, 40 years of non use? Oh, God, it's just going to be endless reforms. There, there were a lot, there were a lot of ways, there are a lot of ways in which we can, uh, th those can be arbitrated. Uh, and and those laws are on the book now, so it's it's not like anybody's fighting in this this big uh, this big battles over uh, you know uh, abandoned property, uh, but it, it, it's just a weird obsession. Property, all property, all human creation, everything that's done in the economy, is a matter of taking the atoms that are just there and restructuring them to create new stuff. And uh, that creation, that act of creation, is done by individuals, uh, by groups, uh, with uh, with uh, you know who uh, who have uh, voluntarily consented to work together under certain terms in order to do it. And uh, those are all uh, creations. And once you say, "No, it doesn't belong to anybody. I can just walk in and take it," then you are establishing. You know, just general warfare. And what you want is then to say, look, I could come in and steal your oranges anytime I want, or your iPhones or whatever. I could come in and steal them all the while. I'll cut you a deal. I'm not going to steal your stuff. If you bribe me. I won't you steal your I won't steal your orange. Uh, the, the actual deal is this. You think I'm stealing your oranges? I think you're stealing the land. To settle that, why don't we just let you do the land thing, grow your oranges, but we're going to have a welfare state to make sure that I don't die just because I don't have anywhere to plant my own orange trees. There is, there is no shortage of land. Where's the shortage of land? God, this country this country is empty. I mean, the United States of America is an empty country. There's no shortage of land. There's plenty of unclaimed land. Nobody, plenty of unclaimed land. 75% of the land west of Mississippi is uninhabited. Yeah, land that I can grow orange trees on. Not you know, orange trees and plenty land. of that land. Uh, you can be innovative. You can innovate irrigation. Uh, there are orange trees in the desert, right, man? You can do a lot of incredible things if you use your mind and you you make an effort to do it. All right, wow. I really should be taking advantage of the fact that I have an economics professor here to uh, fact check some of this. Uh, true or false? Resources are infinite. True, true, true. So far, he's one for one, batting 100, infinite resources. Point two, there's lips. This is, yes, there's no shortage of land. When he said there's no scarcity, I wrote down in my notepad here land, there's, there's always another continent. 
Like, it seems like there's just always another continent. I know. It's, like, so fun to go to a new continent that's been discovered today. That's exciting. And he really says, no, there's always land. Because in the West, it's 70% empty. It's also 80% unlivable by humanity. And we're, for a while, sustaining, like, Las Vegas by destroying watersheds and rivers and so on. Like, just an kind of a stunning thing. Like, to the modern ear, when you say things like, nature exists for us to exploit... Like, that sounds ugly already, and I think we're all aware here, like, ecosystems are real things, and you can push them, and it's okay, and you push them too far, they collapse. We do that all the time, and we have all these organisms you can't view anymore because we drove so many millions of them to extinction, making no impact on Mr. Brook here. It's like, no, it's infinite, it's great, and no scarcity. It does show, like, why, like, libertarians are sort of outcasts, even within kind of mainstream economics, because they're especially like the Ayn Rand types specifically, like that objectivist strain, like libertarians are very common coin, of course, in my field, which is fantastic. But these guys, like they don't even recognize the ways that conservative and libertarian and mainline economists justify markets and private property. You know, there's scarcity. There's only so much. So, right, you know, right. you might not get your, what you might seem to not be getting your share of money from a rich country. This just is so little, all our empty pockets and moths come out. There's just nothing. Uh, that's kind of amazing. Like that's out of the mainstream of how mainstream awful economists justify capitalism. Cause this is the objectivists, you know, they have this weird man, God, like I wrote in my book, I call these guys fascists of capital because they have this insane Superman view, just not of like a racial group, just the biggest assholes on earth who become CEOs and have rich dads. Like that is the, you know, that's why I said in capitalism versus freedom. That's my, you know, my big book on libertarians and their stinkiness. Uh, that's the kind of thing I say in that thing. But I really like that because you know it's an empty country, 70% empty. I mean, yeah, a lot of that is mountains and ice packs <laughs> and desert like in a drop of rain every 9,000 years. But it's empty. And also, I will just say, just to throw this in there, you know, uh, Mr. Brooke, of course, an Israeli-American. And moments like this, it really shows. Like there was the line in there. You could always use a little more moderation than this in a debate because there's a lot of talking over each other and it gets tough. But I did make out Mr. Brooks saying, uh, you know, it's in the desert. He said, Brunick says, I want places I can grow the oranges we're talking about. He says, in the desert, you can grow many things. You'd be surprised. Yeah, of course you'd think that. You took Western capital to make part of the Israeli desert nice while you were dispossessing all the Arabs. That's well, of course you think we could make it. That guy, that guy looks at like the national, the, the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, which ha owns like publicly, of course. They don't belong to nobody. They belong, in fact, to everybody. You can park in, you, you can camp anywhere on Bureau of Land Management land in the Western states. Those things have large tracts out of, you know, what they would call wasteland, you know, not productive land in all these Western states out here where we live, uh, you and me. And uh, they, you know, Brooke looks at that and just sees room for like 5,000 Israels. That's what's happening here. Yeah, I, I mean the uh, right, like it's it is actually striking that uh, that you're on. I mean, it's I was saying earlier in the chat, it's a little bit funny because I you know know the guy. We've debated. I follow him on Twitter. I I, I know what his views are, and um, you know he's so he's so concerned about the metaphorical warfare of the welfare state, but the actual literal wars that are happening right now in Gaza and Ukraine, both of those, he seems to want to keep going, right? Like that, uh, you know, I, I have not seen, I have not seen Iran come out in favor of a ceasefire in either of those conflicts, um, to put it mildly. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it's, it, it is. Um, and of course the God, I mean, that argument that the, Oh, if we don't just recognize each other's property rights, We'll have warfare forever. It's like, yeah, you could say that for any theory of entitlement. Whatever your theory is of who should have what, well, if everybody just accepted that theory, then we'd be fine. But we have conflict because there are people who don't accept it. Like that cuts equally in every direction. No, it doesn't. Um, Those are all just different wrong ideas. This is objectivism. What you said is not even a theory. Yeah, That's exactly. what my theory. My uh, theory is what you say is just dumb and not a theory. It's a great theory I have. I thought of it. But also, of course, the Israel example uh, makes very vivid another problem for his view, which is that, um, look, if we are imagining a alternate fantasy world uh, reality where uh, current distribution of property all came from 
initial acts of Lockheed and labor mixing followed by a series of free market transactions. I mean, I would reject it as the theory of that world too, right? Cause, cause I, I would have a more egalitarian theory of, of who's entitled to what, but, um, but look, let's say for the sake of argument that we completely accept it as the theory of that world still has fucking nothing to do with this one, right? Like this, the, you know, the, the world we actually live in, these distributions of property didn't come from a bunch of Lockheed and homesteading followed by everybody following the rules of the free market. They have a, you know, came from, you know, in, in the, these Western United States where you and I live, uh, you know, uh, something called westward expansion, look into it. Uh, and in, uh, um, in, in England, it came from this really brutal and gruesome, you know, process of enclosures of peasant lands uh and you know in both of those cases those were from a long time ago uh in in israel right where iran's from um the uh the the process the equivalent happened so recently that some of the people it happened to are still like are still living out their dotage in refugee camps right like this is uh if if we actually believed in Lockean property rights, then, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'd, I, I want to see who has the original title for that kibbutz, you know, where they wouldn't let them have tele TVs in the private rooms. Right. That's uh, like, um, I, I think it's entirely possible, right. That that's, that, that would be, that would be some Palestinian farmer, uh, you know, who there, you know, there's a certain amount of like the whole, making the desert bloom. That's not totally made up. There is a certain amount of that that actually happened. But there's also a lot of just like kicking people off who are already farming places. Uh, yeah. so, like, there, there was no farm. Just no one had done it. It's British like, Palestine. That never, no one thought yeah. to put water on this and put a orange tree in it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Pretty amazing stuff too. Yeah, specifically that social conflict bit, you know, Brunig says, you know, social safety net. So, you know, uh, if I can't make a living in the society where you got to, where you won the race one time to the means of production, 9,000 generations ago, maybe you need a social <laughs> safety net in case, you know, the, the monopoly that gives you doesn't leave me with the ability to say, to survive. And he says, no, we're at war now because we have welfare. You know, like, well, it seems like safety net, you know, keeps you from being insanely desperate in the rat race and being at each other's throats and the war of all against all there. So. How is that? And he says, oh, it's because it's the contentiousness created by taxing me for us to have a social safety net. Like you come and tax me and it's organizing people and there's political parties. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like not very, not very coercive sounding at this point. Sounds like a majority making decision about taking away some of the extra treats that you have in your treat vault that you accumulated over 9000 generations. You don't deserve you treat monger. Yeah, I mean. Like where my property ends and yours begin is famously a subject that never leads to contention and violence uh, among property owners, right? Like this is, I mean, obviously people disagree about that all the time, right? I mean, it's the same way that we can disagree about what the appropriate rate of taxation is or, you know, which industry should be public or private or any of these things, right? This is, uh, that you know. It's like, yeah, people, human beings are going to disagree. Uh, and you can say, well, all disagreement would cease if people just, you know, realize that I'm objectively right. But the problem is we can, we all get to say that, right? Yeah. Like all of us can make the same assertion and, you know, for all the good it'll do us. So it's like, yeah, you, you can have a traditional way of, of sorting out disagreements that don't lead to violence is that we all like vote, vote on them, right? We have a democratic procedure to decide who wins. Um, and then, you know, the government we elect, you know, carries out our will, um, you know, but uh, Iran rejects that. So I don't know why that doesn't mean he believes it doesn't believe in a war against of all against all. But yeah, look, I mean, I love the Israel point because it's like as a, you know, because <laughs> I'm not a Lockean or an Ayn Randian. Um, I'm willing to just say, hey, yeah, everybody can, you know, like. I'm perfectly happy to set the clock, start the clock right now and just give everybody an equal share and, you know, and, 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 and proceed yeah. onward. Right. You know, but, uh, but if you, um, but if you actually did take any of this stuff seriously, that's like, Oh, well, you know, the, the property rights we should enforce the ones that could be traced back 
you know, to, uh, you know, hist- you know, like historically, then like, yeah, I don't know. Going to be, uh, you know, going to be an awful lot of uh, Israeli shopping malls. They're going to have to be, uh, they're going to have to be demolished over, you know, to, to, to restore 1940s, you know, farms that, you know, from, you know, that were owned by ethnic cleansing victims. Yeah, that uh, that National Foundation, not exactly NAP conforming, I would say. That's uh, you'd struggle to make that point. I like what you said earlier too. Yeah, I can just say it. you guys all have the it's it's that again objective vism uh, condescension there. You guys all have different views. You said earlier what you say, Brunig, is even a theory. So that's great. As you said, we can all go, that's so funny. I think yours isn't a theory. Take that. Yeah. Oh my God. Checkmate, I guess. That was easier than I expected. This last thing I wanted to say this before, just specifically, uh, like that's such a, like a lot of times conservatives, I feel like anyway, these days uh, are not quite as pure in their pushing away of environmental problems. You know, they'll often like have a tiny conciliar tree and it's like, well, you know, clean water is very important. You know, Coal is great. Like they'll at least have a tiny gesture. Not a lot of them are willing to just launch into there's no scarcity. There is abundance. There's, oh my God, there's free land. Why aren't you just taking a wagon out West right now? You lazy jerk. Like most yeah, of them well, will just take some gesture like that. I just want to say when people say that, I just want to say we're filled with plastics. You're on you and me. We have plastic all in our body and in our fluids and our tissues, tiny bits of plastic, little bits of grandma's Tupperware from 1960. We're enclosed in the Earth's atmosphere. All the shit we've been dumping with an exponentially growing economy you're so damn proud of. It makes a mess along with products, you know, that you're so excited about. We're filled with poisons in us and plastics. It's not abundance. We overdid it in this little dome we live in. We should back off and have some fucking socialism. I don't know. That's uh, that, that bit there. Like, you and I are filled with plastic. So, no to whatever yeah. you're about to talk yeah, I mean, it's the idea, again, it's been a long time since I took my college econ course, but I'm pretty sure that from what I can recall about that textbook, um, it did not include the claim that uh, all resources are infinitely abundant. In fact, I came away with somehow very strongly with the opposite impression. Yeah, that's why you can go out and just pat a right whale, because they just never, you know, we never ran out of them. We never killed them all. Go pat one right like, now. Like, like a... I mean, it seems like it's, it's so funny too. Cause it's like, I don't know. I mean, like Thomas soul has this like cutesy little line. That's like dumb in its own way. That's like, Oh, you know, if there's, if you have enough of everything to go around, there's no economics. Cause you know, cause there's no economizing and it's like, you know, it's, it's silly like wordplay disguises analysis, but it's like, it, it is, it is so funny how different it is. It's like, I don't know. I'm pretty sure most mainstream ec- economics is a lot more like soul than it is like you're on here. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like soul. That's, that's yeah, exactly what I was saying earlier. Like soul is much more in that modern, but we really help the environment. Yes. It's in danger and property rights will allow us to continue to save it with like some of the libertarians and yeah, especially this kind of yeah, Ayn Rand. It's just such a Superman thing. Like nature, it's just there for my great creative work of some fucking natural gas monopoly I have. Uh, it's just, it's just clay for us to use, you know, and you can also, I get a tiny sense of like, they think that about us little people too. Like you yeah. too are just, you know, means to my great end, which is this giant monopolistic behemoth of industry X. Yeah. Uh, props says, I guess this was in reference to the point about Palestine. What are you talking about farms overseas this whole time? Israel's <laughs> an example. The same point applies all over the place, right? This yeah. is, uh, you know, again, um, you'll, you'll, you'll find if you, if you, uh, spend some time looking into the history that, uh, European Americans didn't all, always hold the land that, uh, that, that, that we're on, right. You know, this is, uh, you know, and again, even if you go to jolly old England, right there, are the enclosures, like, you know, every, the actual history of the world is very, uh, is very, very not like everybody just sort of consensually going through a bunch of free market transactions. Uh, that only works if you make some extremely arbitrary decisions about when to start your, your count and ignore everything that happens before it, in which case I would just suggest, okay, well, how about starting the count a year after the transition to socialism? Exactly. Yeah. I want to, we just need a fresh BC AD here. Since, since no one knows anything to anyone, we can throw a debt Jubilee in there. Fuck it. I just heard from your own Brooke. No one owes anything to anyone. 
So I'll be writing that on my credit card bill and saying, I expect not to hear from you again since we're, while we're at it. You see, you want, you want, you want to hand it to you. You want to take my effort. You want to take my creativity and, and be a parasite off of it. And you, you I want the land handed to you. That le nobody, nobody handed me anything. Uh, that leads to, you know, distrust and a breakdown in society. Now, I so, want to, I want to pivot a little bit here. Sorry, go ahead. I think the big, uh, you know, the big social innovation that, that has changed the world dramatically is the recognition of property rights. And the recognition of property rights, that is a, to come up with an actual definition and a system of law around it, has been the one thing that has benefited humanity probably more than any other innovation in human history. I do agree that um, having a kind of uh, peaceful system of what we might call property, right, is useful. But I think the welfare state is part of that, right? Like we have an overall system with lots of rules. We've got bankruptcy, we got securities law, we got corporations law, we got property, we got contract, we got labor, we got, I mean, it just goes on and on. Welfare is part of that overall system. I do think it's a little bit weird. Like you kind of pivot between saying, hey, essentially rule of law is good because it creates stability and reduces conflict and whatever. That's all well and good. And then I say, yeah, okay, so, but just put the welfare state in there. And then from there, you kind of, I would say, equivocate on the concept of conflict. It's no longer people fighting, like literally, you know, fists and guns and stuff. It becomes people fighting, fighting over the parameters of like the old age pension and the child tax credit. And you're like, that's just chaos. Oh my God, what a horrible society. It's like, I don't know, man, it seems okay. The Republicans put out a thing yesterday saying they wanted to reduce. Uh, they wanted to reduce Social Security benefits a little bit. I'm not a huge fan. I might go the other way, but it's pretty peaceful. It goes all right. And I will say this as well for property, as much as we might want to be like, oh, well, property law is just this kind of settled thing. It's its own whole mess. I mean, I went to law school. It's, you know, there's there's possession, there's takings, there's, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a whole bundle of rules. I mean, even the one we were talking about before with abandoned property, how long does that take? What constitutes abandoned property? You, need, you, you need even real. have other. Absolutely. But look, what you're missing is a key concept. And what you're missing is the concept that that Locke started to innovate on and, and it still needs still needs thinking and innovation. And that is the concept of rights. That is the context that bridges morality and politics. It is the context that takes moral individuals living, in, living, in, you know, separate from one another. And once we enter into society, we need our freedoms to protect. And we have basically one right. You have a right to your life. You have a right to make decisions based on your own judgment, free of coercion. I, I can't do that in the world today. I'm coerced by all by many of those laws. Um, and the application of rights, the implementation of rights is property. Property is what I do when I act. When I use my judgment to act, it's to create and build property. And without that protected, you're not protecting my life. That is, if that's not protected, then you're violating my life and you're using force against me. So, you're alive, man. You're doing all right. It's not some random set of laws that we just happen to think, oh, well, let's do this. This might work. Let's play with it. No, this is an essential requirement of human life, human survival. And it, and it, once we establish that what you create is yours, uh, you know, and, and you build the bankruptcy laws and all these laws around that in order to preserve that in the context of rights, in the context of coercion is not allowed. I cannot shoot you. I cannot take the clothes off your back. I cannot walk into your house and take your television. I cannot do that. Once we establish that then you have you have problems of let's how do we exactly define property and uh, how how long of the abandonment and what's what does bankruptcy look like and how, how do the how do we settle these contracts related to bankruptcy but those can all be settled on the perspective of voluntary exchange and can all be thought through and and dealt with but you have to have as a basis the idea that your life is yours your body is yours, your soul, you are, you own yourself in a sense, right? And what you produce is yours. That's the starting point. If you don't have that starting point, 
you're back to, you know, let's fight it out. It's such a weird, it's such a weird, uh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a whiplash to go between, (laughs) um, this idea that like you need these core particular principles. And if you have a welfare state, that means you don't have them. And also my life, I can't live it. And it's like, I live in America, man. Like uh, we have the welfare state. It seems pretty relaxed, all things considered. You know, I'm not, you know, to the extent that people are dying, it's <laughs> it's not because of the welfare state, you know? I don't know. We could, we could talk about that, whether people die from the welfare state. I suspect some do. But, uh, you know, probably the biggest thing about the welfare state is everything you don't have. Uh, the alternative universe in which there wasn't one and things and there would be a lot fewer poor people and uh, life would be a lot better. So just still living, you know, I mean, I, I think bankruptcy is actually a good example. And I don't I, you know, I don't want to bog down in it too much. Economy, but. The mixed economy is, a, is, a, is an economy that we can all somehow still live but still live. It's life. Trust yourself. Yeah. Practice maybe. your religion. I don't want to, you know, God forbid. Um, but you know, you, how you're I, you're an atheist, I guess, right? Because you're Rand. Absolutely, absolutely, I'm an atheist. Yeah, yeah. I was an atheist before. But you're I was, cool with uh, other people being religious. I assume. What's that? You're cool with others practicing their religion. I assume. I'm cool with it, but I I don't particularly admire it or respect it. I I, I think it's sad. Um, All right. So I let mean, me let me let me let me move just a little bit on the moral question, right? Because we talked so before about kind of first principles of property and whatever. One of the consequences of your view about dessert, as I see it, is that people who do not currently produce that they uh, they're not owed anything. They're not they have no moral claim over anything, right? Well, at any given time, about half the population is not working. Um, and so what do we, what do we say about their, what they're owed, right? And we're talking mostly about children, elderly people, disabled people, um, students at home, caregivers and the unemployed. That's about half the population. It seems to me, if you're really hell bent on, you're only owed what you're, what you produce, that that half of the population is not owed anything and and i think that seems pretty immoral and would cause a lot of death and and suffering and misery and maybe we could peg this to the example of someone who was uh, severely physically disabled from birth is now let's say 20 years old can't work what do, what do we make of this person so i would start by saying you're not own anything nobody's owed anything so i don't like the word owed as if there's some collective pool here morally justly whatever you want to you know use it to, to be that no, but words are important. And owed suggests some kind of collectivistic. Uh, somebody is responsible for you. We're, we're each responsible for ourselves. So certainly parents owe. This is one way, one, one time I'll use this word. Uh, they owe their children. They owe their children, uh, you know, to take care of them, feed them, uh, uh, you know, educate them and uh, do the best that they can to make them uh, adults, to turn them into adults. Once they're adults, they don't owe them anything. Why they do they owe them? Why do they, why? Why do they owe them? Into existence. They brought them into existence. There's a moral responsibility once you bring something into existence to take care of it. You can't bring a human, another human being into existence and just to... Um, so why not? It, because by the very act of bringing it into existence, you're taking responsibility over it, given that they can't take care of themselves. So, so there's an implicit contract. There are lots of implicit contracts in life, but w- maybe the biggest one is um, is the implicit contract with uh, with the child that you have, and uh, it, it, you're responsible to it. It's not responsible for you. I don't believe children have a responsibility towards their parents, but parents certainly have a responsibility towards their children. So, if we can take the children out of it, take that class out of it, that would be a good beginning. Uh, beyond that. If somebody's born with a, what did you say? What was the example? A severe disability. Severe disability. Uh, They have a family that can take care of them. Hopefully the family likes them and wants to take care of them. Hopefully they love them. Um, If if they don't? If the care family cannot or will not, then there are charities that will take care of them. And if if we live in a world in which there are no charities that will take care of them, they will die. Um, Mm -hmm. The fact that somebody has a disability does not give them a moral claim against my stuff or my life or my time, right? I mean, one of the things that we ignore is that property, 
particularly a, a produced property, is time. When you take, when you tax me, you're taking part of my life. You're taking part of the time that I've spent, and you're you're negating my own effort in my own life. So he doesn't have a claim against me. I mean, I feel sorry for him, and I might help him if he asks for help. But it's up to me whether to help him or not. The fact that he's disabled is not a claim against my life. Now, who else did you use? Elderly people. Mm -hmm. Elderly people should save while they're while they're not elderly, so that they're not impoverished when they're old. Uh, indeed, I think one of the great sins of the welfare state is that it diminishes exactly that. It diminishes that personal responsibility to save for when you're older. Um, who else? People who have accidents, same position mm -hmm. as the guys with a disability. Unemployed. What's that? Unemployed. I question why they're unemployed. You know, there was a time in America where you could buy in the private market uh, insurance against poverty. You could also buy insurance against um, unemployment, private insurance against unemployment, insurance against poverty. Uh, so if you, uh, for whatever reason, became impoverished, an insurance uh, policy would kick in. That's a voluntary uh, organization. The people voluntarily either participate or don't participate. It's nobody coming to me and forcing me to take more responsibility over your life. Don't know you. Don't don't care. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, there, there are lots of mechanisms in a free society to deal with people who are uh, impoverished. And, and the reality is that people don't just die, even in a free society with no welfare. So it's interesting, right? So when you're put this is this is the Brook value on uh, <laughs> subject after subject, willing to say what mainstream conservatives avoid explicitly saying. Yeah, it's you know, well, a, ch a church should should feed all those people and give them lifelong physical therapy. A church can probably do that for everyone, and if not, yeah, he'll die. That's too bad. Yeah. Next question. Oh, yeah. Well, they should die as well. You should save money. Why didn't you become rich while you were alive? Oh, your husband drank your savings away or something. Oh, oh well, you, well, you have credit card debt. Well, no one owes anything to anyone. So write that on your credit card bill. That's nice. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is good stuff. I want to say, too, this is a great opportunity to look at the divergent comment threads on uh, our wonderful program here. We have very funny comments being made by the uh, forum here. They're cooking it. But if you watch the ones going by on the uh, channel that we're watching, it's a mixed bag. And people are like, yes, Yaron, tell them they must die. <laughs> people are very uh, excited. This is like, which is this is heating up. Just so, so funny. Like, I mean, I, I was actually going to go a little longer, you know, because we, we went a little longer, you know, in the, you know, some of the past comments before I pause. But I can't not pause on that last claim yeah. that he made. That yeah. oh, as a matter of fact, in free society, people don't just die because because uh, of because of lack of welfare. It's like, man, what the fuck are you talking about in the society that we live in right now in two thousand and twenty four? Um, you know, people die for for economic reasons all the time. Yeah. Like, have you heard of like, homeless people? They don't like live a long time because they're in the yeah. fucking streets and streets. Yeah, the life expectancy for being homeless is much worse than the life expectancy for, you know, for being homed. Uh they like this is America, man. We have uh we have people who die cuz their GoFundMe's don't raise enough money to pay for their insulin. Yeah, uh, you know, we ration you want to ration healthcare with government. We ration it with money. Now it's way better. Yeah, exactly. Um and certainly, certainly like you know, when the U.S. was more of what you're on would consider a free society, uh, yeah, people died of easily treatable diseases way more often than they do now in the society where we have this, like, miserable, miserly patchwork that at least does include stuff like Medicaid and Medicare uh, that, uh, that, you know, that, um, that, you know, does does pick up, you know, like uh as as extremely imperfect as those systems are you know better than nothing like uh yeah people die of easily treated adult diseases way more often before it there's still plenty of parts of the world where people die of easily treatable diseases you know way more often because of the lack of things like that they have a like in the 19th century are you kidding me like they have a uh that you don't think you don't think people died from um you know from like in every single one of those situations that you just mentioned. I mean, this is like, uh, 
Yeah, it's it's actually funny because I, I was thinking about uh do you remember in 2012 when Ron Paul was running for president? And you know, I have to say, sometimes I'd see him get up on the Republican debate stage, and I really enjoyed it because on foreign policy, he was actually pretty good. But uh uh but then on domestic policy, he was like nightmarish. And the all time, you know, the example that always stuck in my head the most from the latter is the moderator asked him, okay, Dr. Paul, you know, so you have like a 40, whatever year old, uh, able body worker, et cetera, in your system. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't think he needs health insurance, right? He doesn't buy it. Then it turns out that he needs an operation or he'll die. What should happen? And, uh, Dr. Paul's response was that, well, in the old days, the church would have taken up a collection, right? Like his church would have taken up a collection. Um, oh, oh, a little collecty plate for my $18,000 hospital bill. Oh, oh, well, oh, how charming. Do oh, your old time country, Dr. Paul. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I'm sorry. I interrupted there just because, oh my yeah. God. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. And it's like, well, I mean, man, I, I don't know. I mean, Iran doesn't even want, like, has made it clear that he disapproves of people even going to church or synagogue or whatever. So, um, so, so we don't even have the collection plate, right? <laughs> what's the, what's his yeah. solution? Just a charity where it's just, does anyone put a dollar in for the street people? No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you it's know, like, you if you want to. It's like, it's not like we've never run this experiment. It's not like there weren't charities in the 19th century. There were, right? But people were still also way more likely to die from being poor than they are now. And people are still yeah. right now in 2024 in America, way more likely to die from being poor than they are, for example, in Sweden. Like it's, it's, it's not like these are obscure facts. Yeah, completely. Uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing too. And I do like, I start to go back to that pension thing. Like if you travel in the world, you can go to countries, you know, you sort of mentioned this earlier, you can go to countries like don't have these things because of the third world and yeah. by invading them and supporting dictatorships and sanctioning them or some combination of those things, keeping them in debt peonage, even though no one owes anything to anyone, the Republic of the Congo owes many billions of dollars to investors in Paris and London <laughs> and New York. Frankfurt. So that will, even though no one owes anyone, like, but you, you do, you do though. No one owes anything, but you, you do keep that coming. Uh, uh, if you go to these countries, they don't have a social safety net. And uh, you go there, you can see when you, when you walk on the street, you know, your own says they should, people should save before they become old, which is a great, that's great advice. Like people really should become rich. I always say people should be sexy. That's the thing I say. Why don't they, they, they do that also? As long as I'm just telling them to do things that they may have just no control over in their lives, you know? People should be tall. Why aren't you taller in life? You know, why didn't you become rich? Why didn't you make money? But the point is some people don't have money when they're old because they made bad decisions or they made, got unlucky and got sick or had a bad investment or, you know, got, you know, had a, a wife who had a closet gambling addiction or whatever. People at sometimes at the end of life find they have no money. And he's like, well, they should have saved. It means that they will be poor in large numbers, you know. So it happens when you discover when you go to these countries and walk down the streets, you get to experience the phenomenon of street grandmas. And street grandmas are not a great thing to encounter when you're strolling around in a nice afternoon. Like it's it's a drag when the person asking you for money is 9,000 years old. You know, it's bad enough at any age of person, obviously. But just this is... This again, though, that, as I said at the beginning of this, that's, that's the uh, Ron Brook extra value is he'll just say, oh, well, well, of course they'll be on the streets. They should have been smarter, not individual yeah. retirement accounts will allow us to replace social security, you know, like the George Bush method or something. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, yes, that's definitely one of the ones that is, is most disturbing the, uh, the street grandmas. I mean, I always think of the U S context, uh, the, the one that, uh, one of the ones I find most disturbing that I always wonder about, right. It's like, okay, if you're like a conservative Republican, um, uh, who thinks that, 
you know, who thinks that like America's wars overseas are wonderful. Like don't, do, do you feel any shame when you walk past like homeless veterans, like asking you for, for money? Like, like that, like, does they, does that make you feel ashamed at all that we're not taking care of these people? Cause, cause I pretty much think that every war the U S has fought since the end of world war two has been like monstrously unjust, but it still makes me feel fucking ashamed of the kind of society that we have that, you know, we use these people and discard them. And like, I would think that if you thought that, you know, if you thought those wars were like good and legitimate, that would be even more so. Right. It's like, these are your, your, your heroes. Right. You know, and, yeah. and, and yeah. you know, that's uh, please stand for our armed services members, unless they're <laughs> on the street, then run from our armed <laughs> services. members. Like Those would yeah. be the, the yeah. steps that, Exactly. And it's also particularly interesting that he has, um, that, um, that he did make one. So yeah, nobody owes anybody anything. Of course, you know, nobody owes any, anybody like nobody owes anybody like caring about them as a human being. That's what he really does. Yeah. He means no one owes a child a calorie of energy ever. Like that's what he's saying. Of course you don't owe, you don't, because he, as he said, like he said, we should. We, he's right. Like he said, I am coerced. I am coerced. Like another man, another white gentleman with a lovely, expensive, very nice shirt on, telling us how coerced and oppressed he is. It's set, you know, you feel bad to see these victims, wealthy Israelis. Yeah. Like, of course, the victims of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's also like it is interesting, right? That he did make one exception to nobody owes anybody anything that you owe children. Although he seemed to be pretty clear that he only met your children. Right. Yes. Not everybody very else's. specifically. Right. There's uh it's like, what's that old Arthur Miller play all my sons. Right. You know, that the, uh, the guy who's like, uh, I'm going to spoil an Arthur Miller play from like the middle of the last century. I'm sorry to anybody who hasn't gotten around to watching it, but uh, they, um, <laughs> Uh, but you know, there's the guy who turns out to have like, you know, been like a war profiteer who like sold like defective, uh, you know, uh, defective products to the air force, uh, during world war two. And he, and there's a big issue about like whether one of his sons, you know, like whether his own son was killed, you know, as a result of it. And, you know, and he's like agonizing about it and the titles, you know, it's like the, uh, you know, they should have all been your sons. Right. You know, that they, uh, but of course, um, of course, Euron doesn't think that, right? Like, it's not that, you know, it's like, no, no, no. Very specifically, you owe stuff to your children, right? Like, you know, those other people's children, you know, you don't know anything to them. But yeah. uh, but even there, it's interesting, right? It's like, what, why exactly, right? Like, given the rest of his views. And he said two things without, I think, realizing they can come apart from each other. Uh, one of them is that... Um, is that you chose to, to, to bring them, you know, into the world. Uh, but the other one was, um, so, you know, would not currently apply in many red States, but, uh, the, uh, uh, but the other one was, um, was they can't take care of themselves. It's like, well, hold on. If that second one is pulling any weight here. Yeah. Wait a minute. (laughs) <laughs> and that was the first one with someone who's super disabled. Like we started with that and you were like, ah, oh, well they should let him live in the back of the church or something. Like you, you had no regard then what the fuck is yeah. so to be a kid and helpless, I guess. Yeah. You said, well, hopefully their family likes them. It's like, well, what the, what okay. was that? Yeah. wow. So like if, if they don't, uh, it's like, so, so you're, you know, you said earlier that the welfare state, is a violation of property rights and and without property rights, you don't have life. It's like, well, pretty clearly in a literal sense, you can have life at the same time as some of your income is taxed, right? That I think we've run that experiment pretty extensively uh, on average. In fact, you'll have more life uh, than, you know, in society just they haven't done quite as much of that, but wow. like, but you're also willing to just literally let people die because their families don't or won't, you know, take care of them. Um, he, or, he, he will go that far as to say it. Yeah, again, that is the thing here. Unlike other conservatives who will be weaselly around that, he is saying, like, I don't think that I should have my second home taxed just because this disabled person is going to die in the streets. Yeah. 
Like he's saying, like, yeah, no, it's better for me to have that extra fifty bucks a year that would go into that social security. That's I should, it's better for me to yeah, have just this, to have. It. Yeah, totally. I mean, this is like the uh, uh, so several years ago, Kyle Kalinsky did a debate with Charlie Kirk uh, where he asked him a question that I asked him again in my debate with him. Cause I was like, all right, you've had a year to think about it. What do you, you know, where are you at right now with this? Uh, a couple of years, I think. Um, it was like, would you be willing to tax Jeff Bezos's income by 1% if that would house oh, yeah. a homeless veteran? And yeah, come on at least like, that's great. Like I just, Oh, I love that. That is like very, very well done. Like surely at least, what about veterans? What what about like really sympathetic veterans? You know, what about a vet? He's got a great, yeah. Yeah. He's, got a great three, he's got a great third act. You're gonna love. Come on. Yeah, and uh, and and I asked him that question for the second time. I was like, all right, you've had like two years to think about this, and he was like agonizing about it. It was like he just definitely treated it as a hard question, which is amazing to me. But uh, but I guess Yaron would just say no. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Like, oh. yeah they, no. they don't have a claim on me. He said she. Ha he said he has no claim on me. Yeah. It's like, okay, have we? We've run the paternity test. None of them, none of them are my kid. Okay. Nope. Exactly. <laughs> like we're gonna let those people live in the streets forever, yeah. uh, because something don't something a equals a something something. Yeah, exactly. Because again, nothing we're saying is even a theory. Just to, we should, as a caveat, remind the viewers that nothing we're saying is even a theory, you know, and it's certainly not objective, obviously. That's, you know, above all of us. Yeah, that's pretty great. I'm wondering if Brunig will, I mean, this is also kind of just a free flowing thing because there's so little moderation and it's, you know, it's working, but it's sure. a little more chaotic as an exchange. The thing I always think of when you get to this point, you're like, yes. If they end up on, if those old people and those disabled people or children that no one cared about, they don't have enough, if there's somehow not enough charity to, to give them all their needs. Yeah. I mean, you know, they might just be poor in a poor house or die on the street. I mean, there shouldn't be a poor house, should be separation. That's the state. So this die on the street. You want to be the wealthy person surrounded by starving, disease-ridden peasants? Like half the reason that the rich semi-consented in part to the New Deal and social democracy was, look. We'll clean up the cities and stuff. You can be still wealthy. You know, the wealthiest 1% in this country never got below a third of national income at the height of the New Deal and Great Society. Like, they never got anywhere near poor. You're still the richest. And look, people, even poor people have decent homes and schools, and there's not a million diseases because we have health programs and public health, like you said, flawed Medicare and Medicaid. So much better than the fucking nothing we had before. Don't you want that? Want to let you enjoy your wealth more? Like to me, that's one of those few last ditch. Like, okay, you admit you don't give a shit if we live or die. At least you admit it. Can you at least concede that it's unesthetic watching us do it? You don't want orphans with tuberculosis coughing on your attractive topiary gardening. Like, and by the I, way, I wonder if that'll come up. Sometimes that's the thing you can refer to to get at least some. Like, oh, it would be on a. <laughs> Why you and moved to Gulf Gulch? It's a gated community there. It's nice. While we're talking about coercion, uh, I, I believe you'll find that when you create a huge mass of desperate people, uh, it actually takes a hell of a lot of coercion and practice to uh, to to keep them, you know, keep them from um, off of your property and you know and and to to protect all of your hoarded shit from them. Uh, yeah, this is yeah. Yeah, like you know. I mean, I would, I think, in, I think from what Matt said on Twitter earlier, uh, they are at some point in the remaining 18 minutes going to talk a little bit about Sweden. But like, this is always one of the points that really hits me about this. It's like, look, you can talk about statism and coercion and stuff all you want, but it's like where, which society locks up more of its citizens, right? Yeah. Like, like Norway, by, Sweden, by Finland, far. like the sort of, you know, Nordic uh, strongholds of social democracy, uh, they seem to lock up a much lower percentage of their citizens than the United States of freedom does. And, you know, it, I, I, it does seem like those two facts are s somewhat related that they have a, that the, uh, that like, you know, poverty and desperation, you know, have, um, you know, as, as like, 
you know, have quite a bit to do with, and, you know, and I'm, there are caveats and nuances you can add to this that are all true, but like, you know, in a basic way to quote my least favorite Democrat, it's the economy, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we can take that from them. Like we, we should appropriate that sentence from those guys. That's, they don't deserve that. Pushed on. Okay. When you, when you uh, got the welfare state, um, all no, you don't, don't care. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, there, there are lots of mechanisms in a free society to deal with people who are uh, impoverished. And, and the reality is that people don't just die, even in a free society with no welfare. So it's interesting, right? So when you're pushed on, okay, when you when you uh, gut the welfare state, um, all these non-workers don't have uh, income or ability to live, you, you essentially push towards the idea that, well, we will just more or less recreate similar kinds of transfers, but through other mechanisms. I'm and also- I will say, just from a, from a kind of, uh, I don't know, basic loss, yeah, it's voluntary, right? Uh, Big difference. So who cares, right? If you're doing the same stuff, who cares whether it's because you're tithing, are you sending it on a tax off? Well, it seems like a lot of heat yeah. for, for something that doesn't matter, especially when the welfare state is, you know, a fairly efficient way to get the money you shifted un- around. You have an unbelievable, you know, uh, uh, look, <laughs> they t- you know, right now the welfare state's 50% of my income. There's a lot I could do with that 50% of my income. Uh, it, private insurance is a lot cheaper than the welfare state for a variety of reasons it's a lot cheaper than the welfare state charity is a lot more effective and a lot cheaper than the welfare state uh, oh, that- no 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 on on, on, a, on a sort of dollar let's, basis uh, like you put a dollar into the let's avoid the because i feel like we're edging towards where we're only f- 15 minutes until the empirical discussion so okay okay yeah yeah let's right, stick so- to the, uh, the morality of giving people things who cannot produce themselves you know disabled people students things like this um I guess, Yarn, from your perspective, I mean, I think that Matt is um, intuition pumping to some degree, right? That it, intuitively it feels wrong to say that someone who's disabled ultimately might be out of luck if, uh, you know, there's no charity who's willing to bestow upon them any cash. Um, what is the moral basis for, for such a society? But if that, again, the moral basis is is the, the one I laid out in the beginning, that is the individual individual morality is to pursue one's own happiness, one's own success, one's own flourishing, one's own survival, using one's mind uh, to guide oneself. Uh, And you deal with other people as traders. You deal with other people value for value. Now, uh, as you said, if if, if really we all have this moral intuition, which I'm not sure we all have, but if we all have this moral intuition, then What's the problem? Charity will take care of all of it, right? We all have this. We don't, we don't like to see disabled people dying in the streets, so we'll all pay up voluntarily. You know, and, and, you know, Matt might have a windfall right now, so he'll pay a little bit more to charity, and I might not right now. I might be paying my kids tuition for whatever, so I might not. Each one of us will make a decision about how important this is and how valuable this is, and I think in a decent society, people don't want to see disabled people just dying in the streets, so they would do that. But it would be a lot more effective, a lot more efficient, a lot narrower than a welfare state, which uses I coercion. I found this on the web. Okay, that was, that was Siri objecting to something I said. Um, uh, anyway, so it, 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 is, it is people voluntarily deciding what's important for them or not. But the reality is, and, and this is why I'm, I'm, I'm willing to let Matt push me to say, but what if nobody supports it? Nobody supports them, and they die. That's a state of nature. In nature, if you can't take the resources in your surrounding and manipulate them and change them in order to create something new, you die. We all die. Human beings die unless they can do that capability. And and in nature, if you're born without that capability, you won't survive. The state, the state of nature bit is, is really weird, you know, because... Obviously, human beings have ex- have existed in uh, sort of groups and societies for forever, right? From from the beginning, and um, 
human beings have also had this sort of life cycle where they're productive in some years, not productive in other years. And so sort of the whole of human existence inherently involves finding ways to redistribute from people who are currently producing to people who aren't currently producing. And it's funny the way that one of the ways that he tries to get out of the inherent need for that is to say that we have financial technology now that might facilitate those transfers through essentially individual accounts, right? Savings and individual accounts. That was not a thing until very recently. So from a kind of basic moral principles level, it's not plausible to suppose that a basic feature of human morality requires this kind of financial savings of money that can then be disgorged in old age or disability or whatever to cover yourself or sure. insurance or whatever. That did not exist literally until like a couple hundred years ago at the earliest. So we was- had to forever redistribute from people who are currently producing down to kids, up to olds sideways to disabled and unemployed people we had to be doing that forever Just and we have different right. institutions for doing it the welfare absolutely. state we'll get into it is a very effective one but the idea that as a basic moral principle we don't have to do that because in the state of nature that's just how humans are and whatever that's garbage that's the whole of human society is built around spreading it out to everyone because we're not all working all the time i'm going to have about 40 working years and 40 non-working years so the society is going to have to be producing me for me in those 40 non-working years whether we transfer in those years through financial accounts where we pretend i've got money and it's called capital and blah 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 or we do it in a more literal way with tax and transfers it all amounts to the same thing you got to have a system to do it and the welfare state's a good, a good way to do it I, I yeah sorry i don't mean to go on but just to bake in the idea that forever and ever if you weren't productive you just died is absurd there would be no human beings if that were the case it's just not true. First of all, life expectancy was pretty short. So uh, when you weren't in your productive years, uh, you, you you were already dead anyway, right? So uh, a thousand years ago, life expectancy was 29. Even if you survived to age 10, you didn't live beyond 40, 50. Uh, it was very rare for anybody to live into the 60s or 70s. And most of the people who did live into the 60s and 70s had to work because there was no surplus for other people to give to them. Uh, so they actually did work. Uh, children, as I said, even children, by the way, uh, for almost all of human history until very recently, worked. They produced. They didn't produce. Guess what happened to them? They died. So so the reality is they had to produce. Nobody redistributed wealth to the children. The family either produ- uh, took care of the children, or and the children had to work, or they starved. So I- I- indeed, in the state of nature, it's exactly like that. I remember there's a... There's a, I don't know if it's, it's, I think a documentary on Eskimos where the old people, when they discover they're no no longer productive, go out into the ice and commit suicide because they don't want to be a burden on their kids. Um, This is human society. The the idea, uh, and and instead of celebrating the fact that, wow, we have all this technology, this amazing technology that allows us not to redistribute from other people, but to redistribute inside ourselves from when we're young to when we're old, saving. And, and, and we can invest it so it grows and uh, we can buy insurance. Wow, I mean, this is amazing. We should celebrate that. We should be so hap- uh, grateful for that because now indeed we can live into old age and we can survive beyond old age. And now we're so rich because of capitalism, because of property rights, because of, 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 uh, of, of the fact that we have private property. Because of that, we can now you know, uh, give give uh, help our friends. We can help up disabled. We can create charities. Charities existed in the past. Uh, you know, uh, uh, most the church, people, dude, the church, uh, the church, the church. That was the thing. That, that I don't know what you think tithes were back in the day. Those were those were compulsory. Oh my God! <laughs> you you read you read the history of the church. I don't think you'd be so positive about it. And, I'm not uh, saying it's good. I'm just saying they had a welfare state that was compulsory through ties. That was that was the gain of the church back in the day. It was it was very selectively used and very badly used, just like the welfare state. And it was not large enough. The tithing that came in and the charity they they were much more busy building large cathedrals than they were helping the poor. Because the reality is that human beings were 
unbelievably poor for mo- almost all of human history until very recently. Yeah, so that, overall productivity. But I'm saying, I'm saying, what regardless of the overall level of output, there was necessarily redistribution occurring because you didn't have a hundred percent employment. The employment rates, even if you want to add in maybe fewer retirees, it's not like they were running 80, 90 percent employment rates. That's just not how it how how it played out. I do have a question for you. Do you think children should work or should be able to work? I don't think children should work, but they did. Should they work. be able to? Should they be legally able to? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I think they um, shouldn't be. And then I think instead that the the rule of the society should be that they should uh, they don't, right? all chip it, in and take care of the kids, you know? Don't work today, not because of this uh, of the rules of society. Children don't work today because their parents are wealthy enough so they can keep them out of the fields. They can send them to school. Child labor goes away. Well, school is I, free. I, if it weren't free, I think you'd find many. <laughs> Lower income parents who might uh, calculate differently. Wealth and child labor goes away because now parents can afford to send their kids to school. And uh, they're be, free. They're free, dude. School would be cheaper if it was private. <laughs> it's not free. Nothing's free, right? You pay no, for it. Free. No, you pay for free. Somebody's somebody's paying for it, right? Nothing's free. As yeah, it doesn't there, cost nothing, nothing, but it has no user fee. I, I, if you think someone making, I don't know, 15000 a year, let's say 10000 a year, if the school wasn't free, how would that work for the kid? Oh, God. Well, I think, um, I think again, we're, we might be going into the empirical discussion a bit, but we're in our last five minutes of the moral discussion, so I think this is a good kind of part to round it out, give your last couple of minutes on the morality of the welfare states uh, and go from there. Yarn, since you started, uh, go ahead and start now and then Mac. Okay, so uh, there must be, so the video that we have is about to end after these closings, but from everything they're saying, there must be a second video where they talk about the empirical stuff, which must be what Matt was referring to earlier. Uh, so with any luck, we can find that for, for the next uh, the next one of these. Yeah, I would uh, totally watch another round of this. This is like, this is yeah. a great one, my God. Uh, high value. Yeah, we're creating value. They're acting on materials and creating value. It's happening right in front yeah. of our eyes. Yeah, exactly. The uh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, this is so like they keep being shited for you know they're not supposed to bring up empirical claims here, but but Yaren has um, done some howlers, right? Like uh, they, you know, uh, he's he said. Um, you know, he's he's said repeatedly that private insurance is more efficient. Uh, that you know, school would be uh, less expensive if it were free. And and by the way, that's such a brain dead thing when like conservatives yeah. and libertarians say this nothing's free. It's like yes, nothing is free in the sense that it doesn't cost anything to run it. That literally nobody in the world doesn't know that. But everyone recognizes it. Yes, everybody recognizes it. This is a uh, this is not something anybody anywhere needs to be reminded of or is in danger of forgetting. Um, the question is whether it should be free, like clearly free in 99.999% of ordinary context means free at the point of service. Yes. Right? Where you know, like Matt's point is like, yes, people could afford to not send their kids to the factory and send them to school because school is free at the point of service. So Nobody can't afford to send their kids to school because, uh, because because the because it's not nobody charges you to send your kids to school. That doesn't mean there's no funding mechanism, but it's just not a funding mechanism that's attached to whether or not any individual person is allowed to go, right? Like, and and yeah, clearly, it's free to yeah. yeah, it's free to consume exactly, right? Um, and and it's it's free to consume, which means you know, which means that there's nobody who's who who can't send their kids to school because they can't afford it. Yeah. Uh, of, of course, to the extent that you can afford to pay, you know, taxes, then you're you're charged for that, you know, and that ends up you know, contributing to it, but only to the extent that you can afford it, right? So this is the uh, this is the way that you know. In fact, it's actually vastly more efficient. I mean, this is. Like, what are you talking about? School would be, 
hey, this is an empirical claim. Should be easy to prove. So they have a uh, that the uh, private schools are cheaper to run than public schools. Show me. Right. Show me <laughs> like I, yes. I know for for health insurance, every, the opposite's true. Right. That they have a uh, that um, that there's less overhead in Medicaid and Medicare than there are in uh, any of the private health insurance companies, which makes sense because uh, you you've taken out the uh, the profit seeking middlemen uh, that, you know, um, and, you know, there are a lot of jobs that, you know, there are a lot of jobs that you don't need. In a, uh, yeah, in a, we're not in a like, like hounding people to pay all the time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and even the libertarians at the Mercatus Institute, famously in 2016, they, they as in fact, Matt Brunig uh, showed at the time, uh, he, he, you know, he, he pointed this out and really embarrassed them. Um, they made a big deal of like, you know, Bernie Sanders' proposal for Medicare for all would cost, you know, would cost a uh, hundred zillion dollars over the course of the next thousand years, right? You know, yes. that's always how they do this, right? They had a, uh, yes. That one know. has to be measured over five lifetimes. Yeah, Ted Cruz, we watched Cruz versus Sanders at one point. He got very, very excited when Bernie obliquely referred to a tax increase. He said he's going to raise your taxes. You all heard him. It was uh, <laughs> an exciting moment, yeah. Yeah. Um, Silver, it depends what you mean a little bit, like, uh, you know, and Medicaid's a little so different because you have state level programs, but, uh, there are private contractors for some of it, but certainly not for all of it. Uh, but in any case, they have a, uh, uh, this is, uh, but, but then Matt pointed out something wrote for the people's policy project, hold up the very numbers Mercatus used to get that scary big number over the course of the next 10 years according to their own numbers that's less than what the cost would be of the current healthcare system over the course of the next 10 years it's significant uh, you people are motherless <laughs> motherless these like, people just, that's the, cruel, the meanest thing i can think of to say you you are motherless and that, that is this that is this debate is just like yeah i know they die like in this last segment you know uh your own saying yes well young people they should work if they don't work then they will they will die that's what people do if they don't work they die like this is very appealing i can't believe majorities don't rush to join this no Ooh. that disabled child has no claim on me i want more nice shirts so i'm not going to give you know have money taken from me unless i feel like it that day and do it in front of people so i get praised a lot it says it's nature like that uh, yes they said they die it's nature i love when people say this is natural it's the natural shit who wants nature yeah. we want it to like, for our lives we want it to live in obviously and he's fine with destroying the real nature the nature he wants is yes you will die maybe you die 20 years earlier than your time because you couldn't pay for health care that's fine. You're gonna. The point is, we all die. Everyone dies. If you die way, way, way early because you can't have life saving medicine that I increase the price of by seventy thousand percent, then you know. I mean, we both die. It's still from the like from the view of the age of the sun. It's still it's the same. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it's funny too because like at different points of the debate, you're on is more than willing to invoke uh, like Hobbesian rhetoric about how awful the state of nature is. Right. That um, it's like how much of an improvement it is that we don't live in a state of nature, that we have a civilization with property rights. That's like, well, you know, which is it? Right. It's like, is 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 yeah. that's nature an excuse? Right. Or um, or can we recognize that's like, yeah, I mean, that's sure. There's a you know, there's a sense in which, like, I know what you mean if you say having like a welfare state is unnatural letting people die is natural but in exactly the same sense having medicine is is unnatural yeah. you know being able yeah. to read is unnatural like they have a you know all of the things that make life better for us than uh than the lives that are going to be lived by our descendants if yeah. civilization collapses as a result of like environmental policies that are supported by your own brook like uh, all, all of those things, you know, the, the people wandering around in that Mad Max wasteland, like all the respects in which our lives are better than their lives, uh, you know, are unnatural. And you yeah, know, it's that's unnatural good. to have antibiotics and indoor plumbing. I hate those too. They're terrible. Ugh. 
Uh, yeah, that's classic stuff too. And then of course, charities. There's, there's nothing as breathtaking as the willingness of conservatives to assume that like your local parish can take on like, you know, people are adults and they're insane and they can't take care of themselves and they shit on themselves and can't, you, know, you have to restrain them so they can eat. Like they have disabilities in their minds. Like your, your church isn't up to it, guys. Like you need, you need social institutions for this shit. I'm afraid yeah. you will have to pay tax. You'll only have five pairs of fancy shoes. You'll be okay. Like that's what, that's what Brunig keeps saying. He's like, "What do you mean it's so awful? You look good. You're looking well. You seem all right." I like that approach. It's like, "Well, you seem good, though." I don't know. You look well. I don't think it's that bad. Well, like, that's like, a great are you, approach. Are you really that miserable? I mean, you seem to be healthy and happy, and you know, this is, uh, yeah, no. If you're going to make all this rhetoric about it, it's like, oh, your life requires property rights. Well, clearly. The extreme infringement we do on your property rights is seems to be compatible with your flourishing from what I can tell. Yeah, you seem look, look, here's your Instagram. You went to your daughter's wedding last month. That's nice. You seem good. I don't know. I don't think that you're that that oppressed by the pension system. Yeah, exactly. Um yeah, and, and of course there was a time when when uh, the church did um you know, did uh, pull much more of the the weight of um, providing for various kinds of social needs. Not nearly as well as the modern welfare state does, of course, but they did pull much more of the weight. Uh, but as Matt points out, <laughs> uh, that was a time when tithing was legally mandatory, right? <laughs> like this is, uh, the the uh, the fully voluntary organizations, um, you know. Uh, substituting for for uh for the welfare state is yeah you know, it's true you did walk all the way around to the thing you don't like only now instead of an elected body it's the kid touching church great that's much better thank you yeah i can end this out and then i'll introduce the next time he always goes after me that that doesn't seem okay right. i mean we can, we can, to reverse it. He, he i'm doesn't sorry know the norms. You, you can switch <laughs> it up i guess matt you can go first then yarn you can finish this out you know no big deal Okay, we, so we voluntarily I guess I never come really... to that decision. You know, so I mean, either way, I don't really care. I just thought it was. <laughs> no, he's right. Yarn's right about this. Um, okay, I didn't really ever state kind of the whole thing, but let me, let me, uh, yeah, give you a little spiel here. Okay, so, um, you know, the economy, I would say, basically is like a government program, more or less, right? We have all these institutions that go into it. We've got bankruptcy, we've got securities law, we've got corporations law, we've got all of this, right? And these institutions fit together. It's not right to kind of pick on a few of them and say, oh, I like property and contract, and then go over here and go, oh, those are an invasion in property and contract. Rather, the whole thing fits together. And I think as we did kind of hit on a little bit in our discussion, these things fit together in a sense that they're necessary in order to kind of get overall agreement and avoid conflict in society. And the principles that uh, Yaron tries to rely upon to say there will be no conflict also just basically require people to just kind of go along with it, even though they may disagree with the idea, for example, that you should be able to own something that you never produced, right? So... From a kind of basic starting point, we're all creating the economy. The economy has all these different institutions in it. What we have to decide is what do we want those institutions to look like? Yarn is really hell-bent on this idea that we need to create these institutions that essentially map onto the idea of making sure each person gets what they produce. I think I've shown over and over again that this is not a coherent idea. Everything you produce has inputs that nobody has produced. People inherit things that aren't produced, et cetera, et cetera. He also will then switch back into saying, no, no, it's not so much that I'm against, uh, uh, it's not so much that I'm hell bent on production and, and giving people what they produce. I'm, I'm also really super against coercion and force and violence. Every economic institution rely, relies upon coercion, force, and violence. It's all bundled in there. So what we got to ask ourselves is which of these institutions are the best institutions? To me, I'm an egalitarian. I think if you're going to create a set of institutions that distribute sort of wealth and income and power in society, you want to try to do that in the most equal way. And the main reason I, and that I would say is compatible with some of Yarn's thoughts is that the, if you're going to start preventing people from living their life and grabbing things that they need to live, which is what our property system does, you also need to offset that by making sure that everyone is taken care of to some 
decent extent, right? It would not be fair to violently exclude people from the things that they need to live if you don't also have offsetting institutions. So on a basic moral level, the welfare state promotes equality. The welfare state is fair to those who are excluded from the uh, uh, necessary materials to live. And like yarn, I value life first and foremost, and the welfare state promotes life better than a society with no welfare state. In fact, as much as he starts the whole debate off saying how much he loves life, he has no problem in the end of the debate telling you how many people he is willing to let die. I think that's pretty clear that life is not his main value, that the welfare state is going to get you the most life. And uh, so, so from a moral perspective, I, I, I would think the welfare state is a, is a, is a better institution than, than the lack of a welfare state. All right, Yaron, your final thoughts, and then we can move to the empirical discussion. Yeah, so the, the, the conceptual confusion here is, is, is massive. Um, to defend my own life is not coercion. Um, and since property is necessary for my life, defending my property is defending my life. And therefore, that act of defense is not coercion. Uh, if you equate defense with coercion, then you lose both concepts. Both concepts are meaningless. Coercion means the initiation of force against somebody else's life or property. Property is part of his life. You can't separate the two. Property is essential for human life, for human progress, for human success. And indeed, the only reason we have so much of the wealth that we have today so that Matt can redistribute it based on his desires is because we have recognized the right for property. Without it, none of the wealth that we have today in the world would indeed exist. So property and all forms of wealth are produced. They're produced by somebody's mind and labor. And if you negate property... You negate wealth, you negate human life, and you negate civilization. Um, so I believe that when we come into a community, when we come into a society, uh, this, we have to create institutions, right? As, as Matt mentioned, institutions that protect individual rights, that protect my, life to, my, my right to life, property, uh, my right to free speech, but let's stick to property, life and property. Uh, and that's basically it in terms of the role our institutions play. Everything else is a consequence of that. Everything else is playing in a legitimate country, in a legitimate government, which I don't think we live in today, um, is just a consequence of playing out the government's responsibility to protect the right to life and the right to property. And the right to life and the right to property mean that I have a right to use, again, use my mind, use in pursuit of my values, uh, to use my property as I see fit, free of coercion, free of interference, free of anybody, a majority or minority, telling me what I can and cannot do or taking my stuff. Um, and any institution that exists today that represses that ability doesn't recognize the existence of my property or tries to take it by use of coercion uh, is an illegitimate institution. And the welfare state is just one aspect. I mean, the regulatory state is illegitimate. There's a lot of parts of the American state today that in my view are illegitimate, the welfare state being one of them. Yeah, so I, I'm uh, the part I keep getting fixated on here. And, and yeah, I, I hope... Um, yeah, Matt and I. Um, I hope Rob and I can uh, can can get find a time, maybe in a month, maybe before that, to get together to watch the the empirical round of this. Once we find out where that video is, uh, yeah, let's do that one next, man. I love it. Yeah, yeah, that that sounds fun. But um, but in any case, um, the part I keep getting stuck on is when he says, "Well." property is necessary for life and i'm trying to figure out what he means by that right because that was like one of the most powerful parts of matt's summation when he was like well you said you're you started out talking about the right to life but then you you ended the debate by listing off all the people you're willing to let die right they like die. yes he will die uh so does he just mean that like if you don't have some property, 
then you won't be able to support yourself. So you'll die. Is is that what he means by the right to property is the right to life? Because if if so, if that's what he means, that like you need to have at least some property in order for you to be able to support yourself. Um, you know, all the, and yeah, it's and let's just not even nitpick that further. But like, if that's, if that's what he means, then okay. But clearly if you have some property and then some of it is taxed, but then you've still got plenty left. And also, by the way, the, some of it that's taxed helps pay for social services that you can also benefit from. Clearly all of that's compatible with you, you being alive. So I, I, I don't really get this argument. Yeah. It's kind of amazing how, yeah, when it comes down to, yeah, who has rights, we get down to these insanely fine distinctions. And then when it's property, like everything that is private property is like my like ability to breathe. That's property is life. You take away my property, you're killing me. I can make it sound like people are losing their house over the taxes they're assessing for social security. And, you know, people you know, sometimes can get delinquent and get tax liens, but that's usually not what drives people out of house and home. It's like he, he made this point many times throughout the night. Yeah. Property is, is my life. He said property is life. Yeah. That's pretty great. Which just, again, you, you already raised this point too. Like it really just is about like the different realities of property. As you said, we don't want your TV you're on. You, you can still stream your stories. Like we don't want it. Like it's not about like that private property. Like it's about private property, like oil refineries and data centers and huge estates and food processing plants and giant banks and cell tower networks, you know, and platforms that have, you know, natural online monopolies because they're network based. Like that's the big private property. Like that's the big capital. Like that's the stuff that we're talking about taxing or for crazy socialists expropriating and operating democratically with some national planning, you know, that's what the suggestion is here. There is no, I mean, you know, conservatives have no incentive to ever accept the reality that your personal car is different from the manufacturing system that produces cars in any meaningful way in terms of the power that it gives me or the crazy model of a wealth distribution that comes out of that. So just say like, no, that's my toothbrush, my toothbrush, my oil refinery. Those are the same level of property. And so like my basic need of a shelter like you could tell, like you know, like housing, like there are basic needs. Like the the kernel of truth of what he says is that like without any property at all, like you can't live. You do have to have shelter and food and energy in order to be able to live. We'll conflate that with, well, if you tax my billion dollars, then you're taking away my home. Philosophically, maybe. I think I, I think I, I think I think that's where the connection is. Just that's my that's how I read that. Yeah. Your guess is Obviously. Yeah, I mean, if that's it, right? I mean, that they have a that like, yeah, if you that you're, I'm paying property tax, so you're taking away my home, and I, I need a home to live, right? Then that's just equivocation, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, like maybe you need a home, but that doesn't mean that you need like a hundred percent of the current value of your home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, sheesh. I mean, people, talking like people are being driven by penury to support, you know, special ed teachers for these kids. Like that's many of us are still doing very well. Your own, I've you know, I've seen you do many debates. You seem to do them in your home office. It looks pretty nice. You know, he's he's never doing these things from under a bridge wearing a barrel. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Like he, he seems to. to yeah, no, exactly. He, uh, you yeah, know. Well, he seems to be doing fine, right? Like it's, it's, it seems like he's, he's, he's not only alive, he's, uh, he's flourishing, right? And, and, and good on him, right? But like, I don't, um, <laughs> this is, it's like, yes, sure. I, I, I mean, I have, a, I'm, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad that he's doing well, but I don't, um, I, I don't, I don't know what this, uh, what this business is of like, you know, the welfare state is incompatible with my right to life. It's like, well, I mean, it, it seems like all I have to do to, to, to refute that is to point to you. I mean, are you a ghost? You, you have a, 
you seem to be alive. You seem to be not only alive, but doing well, healthy, happy, long lived. You're, you're doing what you like to do, right. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're, you know, um, I, I don't know. Yeah. This, this seems, uh, this seems like you're fine. And if we're judging whose right to life is being most interfered with, uh, then, you know, you not, continuing to be in possession of a hundred percent of your pre-tax income, but also living a good, hell, happy, healthy life, you know, flying around the world, arguing for letting poor people starve to death. Um, like if we're going to compare that to the guy who dies cause he can't afford the operation, you know, I, I, it seems to me that the cause of life is better served by, by taking care of the second guy at the at the expense of not having you continue to possess literally 100% of your pre-tax income which by the way it's not like the pre-tax income is independent of state involvement in the economy it's 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 not like that just exists in nature right it's it's a it's built on the foundation of complex systems that include tons of statism yeah, all those historic investments in building up those Swiss metallurgical economies, you know, all the way through just the dumb s- systems of standards, like those are all driven by state sanctioned scientific bodies. Science in general is usually like a state supported enterprise wall to wall, whether it's military or civil. I mean, you know, for better or worse, that just is the case, you know. Uh, yeah, pretty amazing, you know, and you think too, like the social safety net, like it reduces the amount of diseases and like, I was saying before, just like the tendency of there to be like horrible epidemics that circulate and can take away your life, which is also property. It can take away your life and you actually like lose your greatest wealth in that cliche is your ability to be healthy. Like, don't you want the filthy, savage, poor people to like get shots so they aren't just spreading diseases you could catch while they're cleaning your toilets or opening a door into a restaurant for you, your own? I mean, like it really does like redound on their quality. I I guess this is why we have... This, this is why we have class segregation, so you don't have to encounter people. But again, it's like that question, and whoever said this, like, who cleans the toilets at Galt's Gulch? Like, you know, you guys no. get away from poor people neighborhoods, but you still need working class people to come and, you know, do the yard work and paint the house and do your back massage and your physical therapy and cook for you. You know, they're going to have diseases. You're going to get sick. You know, it's surely just even self-interest is not enough. To yeah. Turn around. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, I mean, some of us have the uh, crazy radical communist notion that um, that people, you know, that um, everybody that it's it's like wrong to have an unequal distribution of uh, of resources and and economic power where the inequality is outside of the control of the people with the short end of the stick that there's nothing they could do, uh, about it. Right. Like, um, but even if I understand that's probably going way too far. Right. But like, even if you don't accept that kind of extremist nonsense that like everybody equally deserves to live a good life and have power over the institutions that affect them. Um, crazy. You've gone crazy. Yeah. Even if sure. I understand. Right. But even if you're not going that far, Eh, have a little bit of a welfare state so you don't live in a fucking dystopia. Like, as you say, even from a perspective of, of uh, enlightened rich people, self-interest, there's a pretty obvious case to be made for that one. Um, you know, this is, uh, <laughs> you know, you'll be safer, right? And it's just, just, uh, just like, where is it safer to be, to, to live, uh, <laughs> a Euron Brook sort of lifestyle, right? Like the U S or you know, Israel, which for all my objections to it actually has much more of a welfare state than the U S does. Uh, yeah, we're, we're paying for some of it, but that's a different issue. Uh, they have a, uh, but like, uh, the U S or Israel or like Brazil, right? Yeah. yeah. You'd be a lot safer here than in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Like, so maybe it's not even in your interest to turn the United States into Brazil. Yeah, uh, doesn't seem to be slowing them down. But you would think that that kind of, you know, it's all public goods, though. You know, you know, of course, there should be public transit for you workers and uh, public health. But why should I be taxed for it? You know, it's 
take it out of your own pocket and you're poor. So it just doesn't happen. That's always the, I just don't want that tax burden on me. I guess that's just the reaction, but wait, watching these guys like really, really say like, yeah, I know it's, you'll die. It's great. It's, you know, but I'll be <laughs> free. Like, All right. That's yeah. got to really, yeah, no, you'll die. It's kind of sad, I guess, but you know, I, I, that's I'm the, sure those are, those are the breaks, you know, in the state of nature, which is good in this case. Uh, or yeah, yeah, even though it's just clay for my creativity. And if you don't use the clay, you should die. Ugh. But it's natural that uh, you know I eat your corpse after. Like that's just nature, you know. You eat. So that's best. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. But, uh, God, that's great though. I love Brunig. Brooks perfect in this role. He's well cast in the role of having the position that he that he uh, takes. You know, he's he's well he's well assigned. And I don't know. I mean, I'll just say you know, watching Brunig do this is really fun. This is you know, I feel like watching these. I mean, you know, we're always thinking about what's a good arguing you know, model or lesson to take from these pieces. We often talk about that. And I will say, like, I like the subtle power move Brunig started the whole thing off with and getting Yaron's name slightly wrong. Uh, <laughs> you start out alpha move, alpha move. And that's impressive, too, because he's, he's he's doing the whole thing. He's fighting, to me, in my opinion, he's fighting with his hand behind his back the whole time because he's arguing with a cold sore or whatever we're seeing there. Oh, Poor yeah, guy. It looks, like, like it looks like a cold sore. Uh, uh, you have to go know. in front of people and you're talking like it gets pissed off. So I mean, so even it's like, it's like he's doing it, you know, that's like playing Mario blindfolded or something. It's like a skill flex, I feel. Yeah. And he did. Um, yeah, that's all true. I will say it did look to me like I was having a good time. So um, that's uh, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the empirical half. So we cleared it up in the chat. What we watched was uh, Matt Brunick versus Yaron Brook is welfare moral. But there's a second video that's the other round, which is Matt Brunick versus Yaron Brook. Does welfare work? So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, if it's we're going to have to wait until we do the next regularly scheduled one with you and I in a month or we can figure it out before then. But in any case, next time we do this, let's do that. And I will uh, see you then and everybody else on Monday for the regular show, Left is Best.